Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks to Abraham Mohammed, Adam, Adrian Quintana, Alistair Main, Blue Ridge Ranger, Burn Fact Till My Stomach Is As Flat As The Earth, Chow Yun Hat, Chris Ham... Uh, I keep getting this wrong. Hillman. Chris Hillman. Thank you very much indeed. Dank. Dave Rackier Gafford. David Robinson. David Wayne Foster. Daz Studio 68. Edwin Johnson. Erwin Jennisons. Felix Hung. Fireball X. God Rockin. Henrik86, Joshua Balsimo, Kirsten Smith, Liam Nedrick, Life is Short, Maria Neelands, Matt, Missouri Bear, NA Literalist, Nagara, Nathan Thompson, Nyby, Rob H, Skeptic936, Steve ALM, Texas Mike, The Real Gabster, Tina Baker, Unbelievable Productions, and Windrider. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now there is actually a update video on Patreon currently, so if you are a Patreon, go and check it out. It's the most recent video on the Patreon page. Now we are joined by a couple of people in G+, along with two or three people in uh, Discord, so I'll raise the mic on them and you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. That's 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 the thing with my with my line of questioning is like, how did you arrive at these positions? That's okay, what I'm asking. When the Bible scripture says a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, you know he's outside of time. That's that's not wait. <laughs> That's not what that... How did you get to that from that? If like a the way, day is not a day like it is to you and I, then obviously he's outside of time. Correct? But how do, you, how do you get from that to his outside of time from that? How do you know that doesn't say that time like goes because out of... Because he's the creator. It's the same thing we use over here with the programmer. It's not subject to the, to the game. He's outside of the game. Well, I don't think that... I don't think what you... The scripture you, you pointed out to uh, follows. What, what do you think it's <clears throat> oh, saying then? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come on Google Hangouts. Hold on a sec. Uh, where is it? How long have how you been walking with the Lord anyway? How long have you used one since that? When you got, right. um, when you started listening? It can't be more than five years, right? Because you said it started with the flat earth, right? Hey, Neil. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So what does it mean, righteous, to you when Neil says that scripture? You, you well, I'm, it's not about my position. I'm putting... No, you made the claim. <laughs> no, made he the made claim. the claim. Yeah. No, no, hold on. Week, hold on. Last week, you may Hang on. <laughs> last week, you made the claim, and I even brought up the scripture. So what are you? It's pretty clear what it says in the Bible. I don't know what Bible you're reading. Okay, I but, don't know what tools. Hang well, on. Hold on, this is what I want to I get at. It's a more important issue than who wins the debate. How long have you been walking with the, the Lord? And this is not to knock you down or anything. I'm just asking a question. Yeah, well, I've, a, I've always, for as much as I, I can. No, but I'm a, saying, how okay. long have wait, you wait, been wait. saving well, knowledge wants Jesus? To finish. There's a reason why I'm saying this to you. Because this how this told to me when on, I was very Neil. young in the Lord. We're, we're all, especially, we're all, a, hold on, stay, we're all on the same ahead. plan here, Neil. Hold on. I'm, I'm trying to finish the question. Uh, yeah, but I was talking it, to him before you. Oh, go ahead. No, then I'll step out. Go ahead. Finish up. No, go ahead. Finish it. Finish your question. No, no, no. I, I think we, me him. and Neil should finish quickly, and then we can go to 10th. Yeah, we, ahead, did, ahead, we were talking ahead. about it in Discord before. Because I, I, so, I want to ask you, there's a reason why, because especially now, see, I didn't have all this information and all these avenues of ways to speak to people about the Bible. There's a lot of twisted people speaking about things on, 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 on Discord, let me tell you. So just be careful who you're listening to or who you're, or who you're sharing with. Too many voices are not good. You got to get along with God and read that Bible and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Oh, you're That's basing this on. Okay. 
Yeah, I know what you're saying about that. And I I understand what you're saying with that position. There is a lot of... I hear a lot of twisted stuff. Party, party guy. Look at that guy. Yeah, you're correct with that. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but I'm just... I know you're warning. I understand what you're warning you're saying. Well, this is a good time for me to come in if you're done. Okay. That... Jesus said that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. So Neil okay. is right. Uh, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, you can't take one verse in the Bible and make a doctrine out of it. You have Correct. To take the com- you have to take the complete uh, subject matter and see where else that subject is covered. So we know that God is outside of time, as Neil has stated. Cause- okay, stop. All right, never mind. I should let you go because you were going to go into it. Gotcha. Go on. What is the beginning to you? Well, what is it to you? I'm asking. Okay, I'm not going to play this game with you, right? Just, <laughs> all right. I'm done. The I'm beginning. I'm going to do this. All right, all right. The beginning. You did this last week. You did this last right, week. Right, I asked you a simple you. question. No, first to I want me, to know if you're. To me, up. the beginning would be the beginning hang. of creation. Okay, but before we go on, I just want to know if you're going to play around with me or you're going to be honest with me first because I'm not going to well, do this again. I'll be honest. Okay, thank you. Then answer a question if I ask it, because I'm asking sincerely, okay? I'm not trying to trap you. I'm not playing the game with you. I'm trying to help you here. Okay, well, I'm thinking through some scripture, and it says he was there since the beginning. You're right. So, so what had the beginning? Creation. And, and what started at creation at the same time? And I just gave you the clue. Time. God has no beginning. He even stayed. His nature, he, he, he's self-existing. He's not self-created. He never had a beginning. He's always been. There is no time you can apply to God. He doesn't well, that alone will make you new. bang your head in a wall. Hang on. He doesn't learn anything new. He can't because he knows everything. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and in every place. He's omnipresent omniscient and omnipotent these are things the bible does validate throughout from genesis to revelation and that's why we have these doctrines of the nature of god and then you you coming on and taking one verse and saying it's this it's that if it violates any of those things then we need to search the scripture and see what else it says and that's what we're trying to do last weekend and help you here because he's not a door but but he says i am the door Okay, he's not a chicken, but he says, like a hen, I wanted to cover you up, my chicks. He's using earthly language to describe his feelings towards us. He's using right. earthly objects to talk about how to enter into his kingdom like a door. And the cults and the occults have taken the Bible, just like Lucifer in the garden with Adam and Eve, with 50% truth or half truth, half lies, whatever percentage people want to give it. Oh, hath God said, if you eat of the fruit of the tree? So he's challenging God's word, and so he tricks everyone. And this is why we have the word God, so we can't be tricked. So when I meet with a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Christian scientist, and they claim to believe the Bible, which they do, by the way, I say, well, which Bible do you believe? Is it this Bible or is it that Bible? Because there's different Bibles out there, and we know who's made them. And... When I talk to a Mormon, for example, they believe in more than one God. They believe that they're going to die and become a God, just like God is God above us. Well, that's blasphemy. That's ridiculous. But that's what they believe. And they're really nice people. And they try to keep all the laws. And they go to church. They tithe. They do all these things. Uh, On the surface, they look Christian, but they're not. Because when you find out about Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and what they taught, and that Brigham taught that the Holy Spirit came and had sex with Virgin Mary to have Jesus, literal sex, and then later says that it was Adam as a God who came down and had sex with Mary to have Jesus. This is in Brigham Young's writings. This is not a prophet of God starting a new religion. This is a false prophet starting a new religion. Same things with Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they, the Bible talks about an eternal hell. They believe in no hell. They believe it's just annihilation. They teach 
that Jesus was a created being, that he's not God, the son, second person of the Trinity. Tim, that's they Charles Taz the Russell, all right? What? The Jehovah's guy that thought of that, that's Charles Taz Russell, right? Charles says Russell and Judge Rutherford. I've visited right, the right, right. Okay. Watchtower right, over there in Brooklyn. I've talked to so many Jehovah's Witnesses over the years that have knocked on my doors. They don't have the same gospel. It's a different gospel. That's why in the Bible it says there are different Jesuses. Don't be fooled. It says that in the Bible, actually. Why would the Bible says there's different Jesuses? And then it says to the Galatians, even if we or an angel preach another gospel to you, don't listen to them. So this we is have to be have a curse. To Right. So we have to know what the gospel is so that we can understand what a different gospel is. So that's why it's important to read the Bible, not have false teachers tell you, oh, this is what it means and this is what it doesn't mean. Okay, when we but can Go on, your turn. I was just going to say, okay, but now I'm asking you what it means and how you came about it. Very simple. Uh, I've been reading the Bible for now 46 years. I have not found one verse in the Bible that says what you say about God. I found tons of verses and storylines that talk about him being eternal, immutable, and time was created by him. He's not subject by time. Okay, how did you arrive at that position that he is not subject by scripture. time? Oh. Scriptures. I could but give it, you the scriptures. I could send you the scriptures if you like that pertain to this topic, which comes from the Bible directly. Okay, He's so. He is before all things. He has made all things. He never had a beginning. So you can't ascribe time, which is a convention, to someone who's never had a beginning. It's pretty logical. All right. He sums it up when he says, I am Alpha and Omega. That should close let's, the deal. I got it. That's, but let's, 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 let's hone in on something you talked yesterday that was interesting. It was John 6, 4. But there are some of you. Well, just hang on. But before you go there, answer what we just, just said. We just gave uh, you some scripture. But it's it's not like I'm trying to get it more specific. I'm trying to like I am Alpha and Omega. He cre he, he has no beginning. How can time apply to someone who has no beginning when time itself is a convention? It says he knows our thoughts. Uh, Hang Psalm on, Neil. Hang on, Neil. Is no Neil, Neil Psalm... you got the best verse of all, Alpha and Omega, I agree. But I just want righteous to tell me if time is a convention and God has no beginning, how does time apply to God? I think I want to, how do I say this? It doesn't. Just say it. It can't. It's impossible. Yeah, but I wanted to talk, bring it on point to what we discussed last time. To no, no, but answer that question first. Concede or don't concede, but answer it. Well, the, con the convention of time is based on the solar cycle, right? On the, on the sun. And Fine, the but who made the sun? Yes, the creator made the sun and the stars. Was it there before he made it? No. Okay, so it's a convention, no matter what you base it on. So God is not limited or guided by time. He stands outside of time because he made time. He made everything, and from that we get time. We make the convention because we study how the sun moves. Fine. Can you concede to that? Okay. Okay, so God is outside of time. All right. So when the sun stopped, did In Joshua, time stop? Yes, did time stop? Time, the sun stopped. Uh, if you're going to run your time by the sun, and the sun stopped, and you're running your time by the sun, then there was a pause, I suppose. But that's the whole point is that time is a convention. Well, I don't know what you're looking for. Convention based on the sun. So Joshua right, so and everybody... Sun, Right, so they had a longer day. That's all. So time still went on. It's a convention. What? But, you, okay, what so, actually, okay, so okay. Can I jump in? Go ahead. Well, I was gonna try to explain my point clearer. Okay, so it was still the same time because the sun didn't move, but those guys were still battling. So they were battling outside of time then. Well, how about this? What Neil said earlier. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's always been. Is time always been? So, I'm not talking See, about time. I'm talking no, about no, if... No, 
no, but you're saying, here's what you're saying. You're coming from man's viewpoint. You're coming from our viewpoint and saying that. But you, uh, you brought this man's viewpoint in. I did not bring man's viewpoint you in. You brought the I, convention of time in. In contrast to God's nature, not my nature. Okay. I'm trying to answer to his nature, which is no time is part of it because he is he transcends time. There is no time. He's always been. If you've always been, what time is it? Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. There's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcomed back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Ah, we are joined by 10th Man, Righteous Force, Chocolate Sane, Paul Hall, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Good morning, morning. all. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Any signs of a physical geometric sphere edge formerly known as earth curve not from uh, burbank airport uh no any evidence of axial rotation of the earth-based variety huh. i don't see the earth or feel the earth moving not even after a five-hour spectacular with Zanuck trying to argue for the Coriolis effect. I'm amazed. <laughs> oh yeah, that was. That, something that's more. Had. That's more of a head spinning than an earth spinning. <laughs> it was useful. I learned a couple more intricacies to their magic trick. That to me that was, was useful. That was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, that was great. To summarize. All Coriolis claims are an observation from a non-inertial reference frame. As soon as you start to apply any sort of angular momentum retention to a projectile, that is absolutely nothing to do with Coriolis effect, because Coriolis effect, as just stated, is only ever an observation from a non-inertial spinning reference frame, like a roundabout. So what the projectile is doing and what its velocity is and what it's retaining is irrelevant of an observation from a spinning reference frame. So that was uh, an intricacy that we hadn't... We Obviously, we'd, we'd stated it in terms of our clear understanding of the Coriolis effect in and of itself and where it's fiddled with by them to confuse and convolute. And uh, we're just unpacking it and we're getting better and better at doing so. And that's one of those things. Moving on. Hey, Owen, perfect but timing. Hang on, hang, Go on. Hang on. You, you actually covered that way back in 2019 yeah. when he first let out that's what he was doing but the slat show that you did the uh, bonanza five hour whatever long it was that show you unpacked it piece by piece it was wonderful thank you as i say it was a, a painful five hours of debating this stuff just to get one little intricacy to an argument we understood pretty well but obviously there's always things to learn within every argument and Coriolis effect or the claim that they have proof that earth spins with the form of two reference frames one spinning and the other the assumed spinning earth being the one the atmosphere or anything that's not attached to earth being the other 
and then justification for why they don't have any deviation is what you actually end up arguing about with the conservation of momentum, which is not applicable to Coriolis. As I say, Coriolis is only ever your observation, what you see in your reference frame on a non-inertial spinning reference frame. And what you will see so if you I see... see go on. So I see a pattern here then. Uh, we have a geometric... They say we have a geometric horizon, we just can't see it. We have uh, Earth spinning, we just can't see it. <laughs> Well, the no, they say we, it's no, quite up. the contrary. They say we can see it. We see it in the form of a Coriolis drift or deviation from an, from your vantage point. And it's detailed things like you watching a ball curve through a goal because Earth's rotated under the goal. So they do claim it occurs, but they only ever example it with things that stay in the air for a couple of seconds. When in reality, an aeroplane, which is in the air for a considerable amount of time, would show a massive amount of this drift from the ground. If you were watching it, it would seem to curve in a ma great big massive curve because you've got the Earth rotating under the plane, as per the Coriolis effect on a spinning Earth claim. Coriolis effect being real, the effect being you would see the curved trajectory of the plane, even though it's travelling straight, because you're rotating underneath. But if that's the case, i.e. Earth rotates under planes, as per the Coriolis claim, then the flight times are shortened, and they're not. And to get around the fact that they're not shortened, they start arguing about what the projectile, in this instance the plane, will do. And the plane has nothing to do with you observing a plane seem to curve. It's got nothing to do with what the plane's doing, how fast it's going, or anything else. It's just you rotating underneath it, regardless of what it's doing. So next time someone tries to argue about the angular uh, retention of velocity in any particular linear or angular momentum way, just point out that, no, that's nothing to do with Coriolis. Coriolis is only ever an observation from a spinning reference frame, not what the projectile's doing, because the projectile doesn't have to be a projectile you're on a roundabout and you're watching a lamppost cemented into the ground you can observe a Coriolis effect in that because it's not on the ro rotating platform with you so the lamppost will seem to come towards you and seem to go away it's not a projectile though it's concreted into the ground but you're still seeing Coriolis drift because it's not on the non-inertial spinning reference frame ergo it doesn't matter what the projectile does whether it's speeding up slowing down retaining this not retaining that. it makes no difference all you need for the Coriolis effect is you to be rotating underneath something that isn't on your rotating platform. That's it. But Nathan, right. Coriolis effect wanna... doesn't exist because things don't ever leave reference frames. Yeah, unless you're 20 okay. minutes later in the conversation, then things do leave reference frame if required to justify why you don't have deviation. I would say another question to definitely ask that would be is in your narrative is the earth always spinning because <laughs> I asked Danik that the other day and he said yes and then later on proceeded to tell us how it's not spinning <laughs> when you're throwing a ball or a plane goes off in a certain direction but as opposed to another direction like it's supposed to just start spinning if you turn south no you just said it's always spinning <laughs> Which would have to mean it's always spinning. It doesn't matter what direction the projectile is going in. So they destroy the, their the, argument right there. The reason they use a projectile like a bullet is because you have drop in the bullet over a certain, mile, a certain amount of distance. The bullet is going to hit air and going to create resistance. And the bullet is going to start dropping. And then you also have winds. And so you, when shooting long distances, you have to... Uh, anticipate all these things and through testing they know uh, how high you must aim at a target so by the time the bullet gets to the target at this set distance it's going to hit the target now I've done this myself on my property with my rifle as well as my handgun so my projectile doesn't have eyes to see anything I have the eyes I know what's happening and I have to anticipate wind resistance and all this other stuff so for him to go and t and say that the perspective now is from the projectile that means he he went from zanuck to a bullet this is such nonsense as nathan says if the if the earth is spinning underneath a bullet and it's spinning under an airplane and everything else and that obviously cannot be demonstrated i developed a twitch the other day just to let you know after that five hours i was twitching <laughs> You got a twitch. <laughs> yeah, they don't know their own uh, argument. That's the problem. Well, maybe here's a better way to ask the question, though. Maybe instead of saying spinning, does the earth move underneath the bullet? No matter which direction, 
if it's if it, the bullet has to slow down or speed up or curve, the, the earth is moving underneath, not necessarily spinning underneath. But if you say moving underneath, that's a different way of saying it. But what you're essentially asking, Paul, and you're absolutely right, is to get them to concede that what the Coriolis effect actually is, i.e. you're on a roundabout and you're watching a uh, lamppost, i.e. you're looking up at the bulb above the roundabout, but it's not actually attached, it's cemented into the ground. Well, you've got to then get a globe head to concede that the lamppost isn't spinning with you. That's what you've got to get them to concede because basically they'll juxtapose Coriolis effect with you rotating underneath something with not having any Coriolis effect whatsoever on a convoluted cluster screw discussion about conservation of angular or linear momentum. Which isn't Coriolis. That's the point. You, in, in other words, let's just rephrase that. This is quantum erasers method. Immediately get them to define what Coriolis effect is. One reference frame spinning under another. That's what Coriolis effect is. You, if you're observing, Coriolis effect will be on a spinning platform of some description. Now, that's very simple to put into analogy. You're on a roundabout, you throw a ball. It seems to curve away from you because you carry on rotating underneath it after you've thrown it. It's really simple. Now, that effect should just directly translate into Earth if it's spinning. That's what they claim. Instead, we end up with them describing this not actual curving as having an actual spin direction in the form of hurricanes... Well, no, Coriolis is a not actual deviation. In other words, the ball seems to curve because you're spinning underneath it. It's actually traveling straight. Hurricanes have got nothing to do with the Coriolis effect unless you're physically part of the hurricane whirling around and you happen to glance up at an airplane and go, oh, look, it looks like it's curving because I'm traveling in a circle in this hurricane. But other than you being actually an observer in a hurricane spinning around, hurricanes have got nothing to do with Coriolis effect. Coriolis effect is merely you looking at a lamppost from a roundabout and watching it seem to come towards you and seem to go away. That's all it is. It's nothing to do with anything actually drifting. The lamppost isn't moving in my example. Well, and also remember the tangential velocity issue is also in play because the higher altitude you go, the tangential velocity starts to change. So the Earth either will be, you, you'll be starting in a sense, you'll have to move faster than the Earth is spinning underneath of you to keep up. So no, either way, wrong. as soon as you leave Stop. it, you're done. Stop. No? no, wrong. You're immediately talking about what the projectile does. Nothing to do with Coriolis effect, Paul. You have to keep up with the... No, 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 no. Coriolis effect is merely an observation from a spinning platform. What you have to do if you jump off that platform and you become the projectile in your example is nothing to do with Coriolis effect. You don't have to speed up. You don't have to slow down. All you have to do is observe something that's not on your spinning platform. That's it. The observation is Coriolis, not what the projectile's doing. My projectile's not moving. It's a lamppost concreted into the ground, Paul. I don't need anything in, in any form whatsoever of movement in that second inertial reference frame. And never will they ever have any descriptions of what's happening in that inertial reference frame applicable either. Because what's happening in the inertial reference frame is irrelevant. All that matters is you, as an observer, are rotating underneath it. So if it's directly translatable to a ball earth... And on a roundabout, I throw a ball, it seems to curve. On a ball earth, you throw a ball, it seems to curve if it's spinning. It's just that simple. Now, in the form of an aeroplane, that's like a glorified ball. It should be curving from your vantage point. Now, when you start detailing what the plane would need to do, it's irrelevant of Coriolis. Because the projectile, you can't have the plane with a, a Coriolis meter, a, a, you know, coping with the Coriolis deflection, because it's non-existent from the plane. Not in, in, in any way relevant. Because Coriolis is an observation of it seeming to curve. So as soon as you step outside what you see seem to curve and start detailing what the plane or lamppost is doing, it's not Coriolis anymore. Hey, Nathan. Hey, everybody. Hey, Brian. Yeah. And hey, are we That's as well. right, Nathan. That's right, Nathan. Uh, because they want you to argue within the begging the question. So they want to argue that the higher you go, rather than stay on the subject, which is Coriolis. Yeah. Did you say something to me, Nathan? You can, but I'll just round that out, Brian. You're right, exactly, 10th man. The higher you go, well, what, as a projectile, well, no, 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 you're not ever going to be detailing that because it's me witnessing you going higher and higher and higher and higher and seeming to curve as you do so from my vantage point spinning underneath you on a roundabout. That's Coriolis, what I see of you curving. That's Coriolis. 
as soon as you say, well, I've got to keep up with the ground below the roundabout. I'm a drone and I'm keeping up with the X that I've taped below me because I'm conserving the momentum of the... Well, you're describing the projectile. That's not Coriolis anymore. Coriolis is only the observation from the reference frame that's spinning. Beyond that, nothing's important. Go on, Brian. Oh, uh, no, sorry. I thought you had said something to me. But uh, on, the, on this, uh, on this uh, actual subject, uh, QE puts this uh, straight in that audio clip he did over the weekend on Fight the Flat Earth. Because uh, Fight the Flat Earth uh, claims that, it, it, yeah, it, that tangential velocity is important. But if you're on a non-inertial non reference frame that's, uh, that's moving around, spinning, then it all has, every part of that has the same angular velocity. And that's the only thing that matters. So tangen tangential velocity has not to do with uh, you're, you're, anything you're, to do with You're, 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 you're wrong in the same way angular. Paul's wrong. No. The tangential velocity that you're going to be referencing in the Coriolis effect is zero. You're only ever referencing what you see on a non-inertial reference frame. You and the reference frame are as one. And in comparison to the reference frame itself and you, you've got no momentum to preserve because the only description of the claimed curve or the apparent deviation that the trajectory of the bullet in the inertial reference frame is going to be described with is only ever you seeing a curve because your non-inertial reference frame is the one that gives you the apparent drift. So you're seeing the ball seem to curve from a non-inertial frame of reference. In other words, you and everything around you is one thing not moving, not with inertia. The inertia is, in Coriolis effect, described in, guess what, the inertial reference frame. And why is it the inertial reference frame? Well, because that's where you're seeing the apparent drift. Apparent, meaning not actual. So in the inertial reference frame, I've got a lamppost. Is it moving? No, it's concreted into the ground. Does it look like it's moving as I turn on the roundabout? Yeah, it looks like it's got inertia. It's only apparently, though. It's not actual drift that it's performing as you see it come towards you. It's concreted into the ground. So therefore, when you're describing the effect of Coriolis, and the effect of Coriolis is a not actual deviation in the inertial reference frame so the movement the inertia the not actual drift is in the frame of reference that you're not a part of and the reference frame you are a part of is non-inertial so what are you going to retain if you're going to stay within the confines of describing Coriolis effect your non-inertial reference frames inertia well there isn't any oh so we're going to immediately start describing the inertia in the bullet well, that's got nothing to do with Coriolis because Coriolis is me observing that bullet seeming to curve when it's sat on top of the lamppost, not moving at all. No, I totally agree with all that. I know that. Uh, but what, what, what QE says about angular momentum or uh, angular uh, velocity was that it, that argument that the bore us put forward about tangential velocity is completely load of rubbish because if you're on a non-inertial reference frame, then all of it is moving. So it has angular velocity. Nothing to do, like, they just, he, his point was that the uh, that angular velocity totally blows that a tangential velocity nonsense out of the water. That was the point of the... I see what you're what saying. You so if you're saying you're retaining the angular velocity, well, then you'd be curving after you left the platform. So the fact that you're going to have or assert that there's a Coriolis effect must mean that you've got linear as opposed to angular and the two aren't, they're mutually exclusive in this regard, because if you had one, you wouldn't be observing Coriolis deviation if it's preserving the angular momentum. Therefore, it is actually curving. So you're not observing an apparent deviation anymore. You're observing an actual deviation, which isn't Coriolis. Uh, I was only talking about in his reference to, to the likes of the boilers, talking about tangential uh, uh, velocity. Uh, being a part of, uh, and you have to, to, to have to be taken that into account for a Coriolis effect. You don't. He just but, puts that to bed by saying that if you're on a non-inertial reference frame that's moving, then every part of that like has the same angle of velocity, and that's the only part that matters. Like that's basically he's basically saying it, it, the same thing. He's saying that whole thing is moving. You're on it, and the thing you're looking at is not. 
or it is moving, but it's moving in a straight line, and it but is Brian, to deviate. Yeah. But, but what the first part of what Nathan said is that if you go there with the tangential velocity, then you're in the begging the question argument already. When you have to define what Coriolis is, and it's a apparent deviation, it's not actually moving. You're moving. I, I know that tent. I know all that. I think maybe listen to QE's uh, piece on that he no, did no, about no, I, I, that'll I'm explain not, it. Not, I know you yeah. know it. I'm not saying anything against that. What I'm saying is, if let's say there was a baller in front of me now and we're having a discussion, and I, and he and he says tangential, I would say that's not Coriolis. Quick shout out to DJ Neo Shaman. Keep destroying ignorance and globe lies, one mind at a time. Hashtag Black Swan for the win. Love you guys. Hashtag Carpedium. Hashtag no fear. Hashtag peace be with ball busters and loved ones. Thanks sign and kissy smiley face sign. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat. DJ Neo Shaman. Really appreciate your support. So they want to argue something else other than Coriolis at that point is what I'm saying. No, you're absolutely correct because that's the first place to start going to. To start going to that tangential velocity nonsense. They start, uh, they, they start, like, basically, you start getting asked for, have you got the mathematics to support blah 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 It's like, a mathematics has nothing to do with a visual effect. It's just an effect. Well, they're in bigger trouble if they want to go there. Because if they want to go to tangential velocity, then the Earth is actually, what, rotating at different speeds the higher you go, correct? This is their claim, yeah, because it's making smaller circles. Fine. You know, then, if you're going towards the top. Fine. Then why is the, the flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to LA not shorter then? Yeah, they, they don't get, they, they, they never let the argument get to there. Uh, well, I, I had I'm this argument and they all let it get on. to there. Hold on. <laughs> you're, you're talking at cross purposes. Your Tenth Man's talking about the, the, the deviation as Earth rotates underneath and Brian's talking about as you raise an elevation, you've got a bigger circumference to traverse. Therefore, it's a first law of thermodynamics violation if you're asserting that you're retaining the angular momentum. Because as you increase in altitude, you're going to have to increase in speed to match the velocity of the ground beneath you because you're traveling in a greater circumference. So that's a first law of thermodynamics violation. I think you're talking at cross purposes, though. Well, there are two different arguments, and that's what I was trying to say. So I think... Uh... What Brian was saying is that ballers will always have something else to go to, and that's what he was role-playing. And I was saying, well, I wouldn't even let it get there because tangential speed has nothing to do with Coriolis. Quick shout-out to Rack Here Life. He says, Lake Pontchartrain optics were angry this weekend, my friend. Curved view, but never measured. He had uh, some donuts. <laughs> so Rack Here Life did a Pontchartrain observation, and I think it's... I'm not certain because I didn't I didn't question it, but I think it's the bridges in the far distance. But he's got so much refraction they've curled into donuts. <laughs> That's really quite amusing. Check it out, it's on Rackier Life's channel. Thank you very much for the super chat, Rackier Life. Are we exhausted any evidence of axial rotation? Should we move on? I'll just say thanks for handing my butt to me. Thanks, thanks, Nathan. I appreciate it. It's not that I, I, it's not that I want to hand you your but it's excellent. I'd rather you did say things like that because it means I get another opportunity to point out that as soon as you start detailing what's happening in the inertial reference frame with the, the trajectory of a, a an aeroplane or a ball or anything else, you're no longer detailing what's happening from your vantage point in regards to Coriolis, which is only ever applicable from the spinning reference frame. So who cares what the bullet or drone or anything else is doing? It's not relevant to the argument if they've got one for Coriolis. So as soon as you can take them away from that, well, what's happening is it's taking off with the speed of the Earth rotating and it's retaining that and then technically going backwards till it speeds up enough to overcome the <laughs> speed it's retained. None of this is relevant to you observing apparent deviation from a non-inertial reference frame that's spinning as you spin on it. That's nothing to do with any of that. So that's just their way of immediately juxtaposing what you should be seeing if you've got Coriolis with what's happening to a projectile in an inertial reference frame that you're supposed to be observing if you're describing Coriolis. You're no longer describing it. You're describing what's happening to the trajectory of a bullet that could be being observed and talked about if they were still talking about Coriolis, but they're not. That's the point. Any more for any more? Can we move on? 
Yeah, one more. I'm sorry, but you t you just triggered it in my mind. Uh, but that's the temptation when they say that it's on me, and you know people like me want to jump on it because it's so obvious the plane can't be going backwards. But it's it's another argument. It's not the Coriolis. So we have to really hold our ground when talking about subjects and say that's another subject. We'll get to that. Your plane going backwards later. But what is Coriolis? What's the causes of Coriolis? And this is the, the temptation is when they throw one of those things, oh, you just want to go there because it's so stupid, but you just get off Coriolis when you do. Well, you can, but you've got to be, uh, you know, without blowing too much smoke of his ass, at the quantum eraser level where you're detailing the absurdity of their argument because they won't let it go. They've gone round in a circle five times asserting, yeah, yeah, it's retaining the angular momentum of the Earth and, yeah, it's flying backwards. You're only going to get to that stage if you can lead them very, very subtly down that path till they admit that like Zanuck did. Yeah, planes literally flying backwards in his world. It's nuts. But you can only get them to the point of absurdity if you're pretty skilled and, and understand it. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, even myself, I wouldn't wouldn't try that, which is why I take the much more, you know, um, brutal approach and say, no, this is where I'll draw the line with, you know, someone like Paul. It doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't be arguing that way. You do whatever you like. Same with space, right? If someone wants to argue that rockets can't work in space, feel free. My point would be that, well, yeah, you can cut that off at the legs by pointing out that you can't have gas pressure without a container. So therefore, why argue about whether or not rockets will work in a region that doesn't exist? It seems pointless. Even if you win your argument and prove beyond certitude that rockets won't work in a sky vacuum, all you've done is debunked a bit of an element of NASA, as opposed to the entirety of the heliocentric worldview that the sky is a vacuum. So it's just one being more effective. In terms of arguing about what a the trajectory based on their argument of a bullet or a plane does in the inertial reference frame, in other words, sod all to do with Coriolis at this point, we're not detailing the observation from the non-inertial reference frame, which is to say we're not describing Coriolis. But if you take them down their own path to the point of absurdity as Quantum Eraser does, you've got to be acutely aware of where they'll try and use that to their advantage, beg the question and just use it to say, well, you're already admitting Earth spinning and that's precisely what Zanuck did. So he said, when, I, when he started to use the argument, I stopped him. No, you're not just going to dictate that the plane's moving at 800 miles an hour and it's on the tarmac, not moving. No, you don't get to beg the question. His reason for utilising your incorrect assertion that Earth is turning with the plane moving at 800 miles an hour leaves you with the plane going backwards, which is why he's asserting it. Zanuck will only use that to beg the question. In other words... Go through the process of allowing the audience to hear that the ground is moving with the plane moving at 800 miles an hour immediately without any proof whatsoever at the beginning of his argument. So then he can spend 25, 30 minutes, an hour, five hours arguing about whatever he likes. He's got the begging the question fallacy in the middle of it at the beginning of his argument. And to the audience's uh, 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 realisation, all you're doing is arguing about how and why Earth is turning because the begging the question fallacy has been let in. But, you know, that, like I say, it does, it does take a, perhaps even a bit of teamwork because, I, like I say, Quantum Eraser wouldn't be capable of then turning around to Zanuck and saying, no, you don't get to say if Earth is spinning, blah, 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 blah. I only get to do that, but I can, as the moderator between those two, I can say, why the hell can you just say Earth is spinning at 800 miles an hour with a plane on the tarmac without any justifiable reason when that's only going to give you a lack of Coriolis effect, the claim proof we spin? Any more for any more. Okay, I, I, I will. One, one, one more thing. thing. So I go after Paul. Yeah. One Paul. Okay, then that begs another question. There another uh, uh, brings up another question. How can an observation do anything? It can't. That's why when you're talking about the projectile and what it's retaining, it's irrelevant. Correct, Paul. Very succinctly asked. I find it's a yeah. good way, though, to elucidate how how much they double speak because when Zanuck is detailing how the plane is conserving momentum when it's taking off due west with the earth spinning west to east well the, the earth is spinning west to east which is why it's conserving that momentum right well two minutes prior he said that the earth doesn't spin under the airplane unless it turns south or north so this is just another way to, to show how their double speak just doesn't work yeah, but you've got to have these measures in place and people who are capable of arguing in that manner if you essentially have a worldview and religion that isn't the case, i.e. a spinning ball earth in a vacuum. If it's not the case, 
You're never going to have a coherent argument. You're never going to form logical consistency because Earth isn't turning. It'd be blatantly bloody obvious if it was. Same as if it was curved. Just to, just to uh, address what Ken said about the airplane. Can I just add something? Go ahead, George. Uh, one second. All right. Party poet. You're making coffee or something, my friend. You're making a lot of racket. Go ahead, Brian, and then George, if you want to go after. Yeah, just I just want to say that uh, when it comes to the argument of the airplanes, it depends on who you're who you're dealing with, because Zanuck will argue uh, that the airplane will will do certain things due to uh, because of the movement of the globe out and different uh, latitudes, but someone else like flight flight the flat out for instance, he told me the weekend. Uh, I just am using him as a reference because he just told me it that uh, airplanes don't experience any Coriolis. You know, so they, some of them just take airplanes completely out of the argument and try to argue that they're not involved at all. But he's correct. Well, he is, but... <laughs> you don't yeah. experience... Let me just break that down. You don't experience Coriolis from the airplane. You might go, oh, what are you talking about? There's always planes being talked about. No, you, from the ground, watch a plane that's flying straight. Now, in reality, when I watch a plane, it flies straight because it is straight. However, the globe Earth claim is that when you observe an aeroplane, its path is curving. Now, why is it curving? Well, because Earth's turning underneath. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. If it's travelling on the exact same latitude, there's not going to be any Coriolis deviation. It's travelling on the same exact uh, uh, latitude. So, therefore, why would you see any deviation? You wouldn't. You've just got Earth rotating underneath, shortening the flight times, which is our argument. But the point is, if there is going to be any deviation that you see from the ground it's going to be because the plane is traveling straight and from your vantage point on the ground it seems to curve now the plane hasn't got to account for anything what's he going to account for oh quick change the uh, coriolis meter there's a guy watching us on the ground and he seems to think we're curving so quick let's correct for that no, they don't have to correct for a damn thing. It's an apparent deflection seen from the ground. So the guy in the plane doesn't know that there's a guy on the ground watching. And from his point of view, it looks like it's curving. Number one, it only looks like it's curving. And number two, the plane hasn't got the slightest clue of anything occurring from the ground. It's not on the ground. So there's no accounting for Coriolis in projectiles. But that's the magic trick. They want to talk all day long about what the projectile's doing when I can example Coriolis with an example that's got a concrete lamppost that's not moving an inch. Well, yeah, you're right. He, he, the pilot of that plane wouldn't have to account for anything until he's trying to land and trying to land on a spinning runway. That'll be fun. Yeah, <laughs> precisely. He's only got to worry about the fact the ground's spinning underneath him, not the fact that I might see his plane curving when it's in the air. He hasn't got to worry about that. Yeah, but as Chocolate rightly points out, if the ground's spinning underneath him, he's got a big problem when he comes in to land. An enormous problem that wouldn't allow planes to land <laughs> unless they took massive steps to account for the fact the ground's turning underneath them, which is our point. It would not only shorten flight times, it would make landing incredibly difficult. Well, you would need special approach, uh, yeah, paths. Like, oh, you, you want to land there with the supposed spin, then you got to approach it a little bit more to the side, and they, this should be all mapped out for every pilot to take. That's they would the have to, approach. they would only have to have landings east to, uh, east to west and west to east. They can land in the other direction because they have already enough troubles with winds. Sure. Right. Also My point is, what you're identifying is the Coriolis causes. Now, what causes us to see an apparent drift is Earth rotating under a plane. Well, the aircraft's definitely going to have to concern himself with what's giving me that effect. I'm only seeing that effect because Earth's rotating under the plane. So the cause of that effect the plane's going to have to worry about, the fact that it's claimed the Earth's rotating under the plane, now, no, no plane's ever having to cope with that, ever. That's why it debunks the claim we're spinning. But the only thing we're going to ever argue about from this point forward, certainly on this show, is what we will see from a non-inertial spinning reference frame. As soon as someone starts saying, well, it's retaining velocity, what is? The projectile, I don't care. I'm not the projectile. 
What I observe of something doesn't matter if it's concreted into the ground or moving at a thousand miles an hour, gaining speed, losing speed, it doesn't matter. Coriolis effect is me from the ground seeing it seem to curve. And if my lamp post seems to curve towards me and curve away from me, I don't have to worry about its retention of angular velocity. It's concreted into the ground. But all they're going to do all day is talk about the projectile. Like Simon Dan the moron shows us a guy bouncing up and down not drifting. Well, all we need to see for Coriolis effect is me watching that and a drift occurring. Not no drift. Not what the guy does. Because the guy and what he does bouncing up and down is nothing to do with Coriolis effect. It's merely what we observe of the guy. Yeah. Well, and technically, they can't argue Coriolis technically, if you really think about it. There is, in their paradigm, in the globe paradigm, there is no inertial reference frame. There can't be. Everything's moving. Yeah, no, they haven't got a second reference frame. Look, they've been arguing from the start on. It, it's also contradictive. They say the Coriolis effect is there due to Earth spin. You just can never detect it. Yet claims are still being put out that that there are sightings due to Coriolis effect, despite the bottom line claim approach being there is no sign of Coriolis effect that you can measure, even though you're supposed to think it's actually spinning. It's it's been like this from the start. You know yeah. that, right, Nathan? Yeah, it should be Coriolis effect. If Earth's spinning, we should observe Coriolis effect. That's the positive assertion from the globe Earth religion. We spin, therefore we've got Coriolis effect. That's what globe heads state as their rhetoric. But we don't see any. So what we fight about is why we don't see any deviation, why we don't have any Coriolis effect, why Earth isn't rotating underneath anything to give you Coriolis effect. In other words... We don't argue about what's causing Coriolis effect. We argue about why we don't have any. We get told that when you ask how come we don't something. see any of this, you get told that we, you do, you just don't understand. That's the exact, exact words you get. Yeah, that's just another magic trick. Go ahead, George. We've been waiting in the sidelines for ages now. Uh, so, sorry, I, I just wanted to add here... Um, uh, a, a little thing that I don't think we are seeing the the whole the whole thing because they they are asserting that um, the observation that we see of the Coriolis is the sun because the sun is, on their paradigm is stopped and we are spinning under the sun that's the only observation that we see this could be ex explainable uh, centuries ago but not now that we uh, we can do flights we can. Uh, um, uh, travel on airplanes. We can travel in many ways. So we don't see we don't see this observation because the Coriolis, the movement is up and down. It's a, a linear movement, but uh, it, the, the explanation is up and down. And we see, don't ever observe saying. this in nature. I understand. So you're saying that given that the, the rhetoric we get in the trenches from someone like Zanik is no, you'll only ever get the second reference frame, the inertial reference frame, if you leave Earth and it's gas pressure that's not filling the vacuum. <laughs> and then you can have your inertial reference frame observing back down to Earth as a sphere. Well, in that example, you would say, you would assert it for, well, to have the Coriolis effect, obviously you're going to be back on the inertial, uh, sorry, the non-inertial spinning ball Earth as it's claimed to be. And the only thing that's going to give you that is the vector that you would, you would observe of the sun's trajectory. Because in the solar system reference frame description, You've got the sun fixed at the centre and us moving around it. So therefore, its movement is only an apparent movement from our vantage point. Hence, you get the vector, the curved trajectory, the Coriolis effect with the sun, right? That's what you're saying. We're turning underneath it. It's the only other thing in the other reference frame. Exactly, because we not only we're we going uh, around the sun, we are spinning, spinning on our, our own axis. And that is the movement that they say is the Coriolis. This is the only... The only thing that they can attach to, to Earth on that paradigm, it's the only one. The thing is, with when we actually see reality, if the, uh, a, a, an object on a straight line or an helicopter or a drone going on a straight line up and down, if you are uh, spinning underneath it, uh, when you look at it, uh, you see the Coriolis effect. Now, if you have the reverse um, image, if you are on the, uh, on, the, on the drone looking at the... Uh, at the um, 
merry-go-round spinning, what you are observing is a, a centrifugal force, which is completely different, nothing to do with Coriolis whatsoever. Precisely. Well put. Good point. Right, let's move on. I'm not going to ask if anyone's got anything else to add. Although we have got Mole Man in now. Has anybody taken him off mute? Wait, we haven't talked enough about the Coriolis effect? He vanished. <laughs> I know there he is. No, he's been off mute. That's fine. Okay, any evidence of the distance to the sun? It's over there. I know this one. I know this one. <laughs> I know, I know. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Well, from here to the sun is the same distance as from the sun here. How profound. How do you know that? What if the sun is a reflection of something else? And in other words, what you're seeing isn't necessarily the point source of the light itself or whatever generates what we call that light. Therefore, the distance between whatever creates it and what we see isn't going to be half, is it? You just don't know what it is to make that assertion. Even if we did know, uh, we cannot measure something that uh, it, it never stops. It's always in movement anyway. Even from our own side, no concession. <laughs> I love it. So we do not agree then that you'd have to know what it is and how it's created in order to make the assertion that your distance from us to it, that would be what we see of it, the apparent position of the sun, may not be the same as the distance from the sun to us if it's got a different actual source. Because what the source is and what we apparently see might be different. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm entirely with you. I, I don't want to assert that I know what the sun is. I'm just saying you wouldn't know. You don't know what the sun is. You will never know. Uh, even if you knew, if it was a solid thing, you couldn't measure something that is in movement. Even there though, it is. Even on their part of that. There it is. You inserted it for me. If it was a solid thing, your assertion would make perfect sense. Or, or you know, in some way, a physical entity. It doesn't have to necessarily be solid. solid. But, you know, if it was a... If we knew what it was, your your sense, your sense, statement would make a lot more sense and it wouldn't be so pulled apart, even though I'm doing it kind of with, with tongue-in-cheek. Right. A physical entity opposing a, a holographic, light-based entity. Or anything else, for that matter. That's just one in a million possibilities, right, Arwen? And I'm not saying you're wrong. Definitely not saying you're right. It's like the, the first thing that goes down. Hold on, Arwen. Go, go ahead, George. Sorry, I was saying, like, uh, they say we know the distance to the gas giant. Yeah. Well, they know what it is and where it is, and they've already decided, based on Kepler's third law of interplanetary motion and Christian Hugin's assumption of Venus being the same R value as Earth that's been assumed in the first instance. Given that they know all that stuff, because they made it up themselves, <laughs> they know what it is and where it is and how much it weighs, and <laughs> a lot of other nonsense that we wouldn't ever dare assert. But we'd be ridiculed for not asserting it and telling them a new fairy tale, now wouldn't we? Well, what what do you say the sun is then? I d don't know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know, I haven't got a clue. Well, that's outrageous, therefore your model fails. What, what model? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, your flat earth model fails if you can't tell me what the sun is with a new just-so story that's equally as compelling as the nonsense these dudes made up. Nathan, at best, all you've done is disprove the radius of the earth. Christian Hugens. Radius of the distance to the sun. <laughs> Let's move on. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Uh, I was told the weekend that there is. Sorry, go on. Uh, Aaron, I talk after. Okay, I was just going to say fall down, go boom, boom, or. Uh, Mostly yeah. down. Move, move up, go poof, poof. You know? Go down, go boom, boom. Mostly right. down. Or go float Brian. up, go poof, poof. You, you were told what at the weekend? What have you done this weekend, Brian? Uh, I, was, I was debating flight the flat out there or flight the night. And uh, I was told by him that uh, when I asked, have you, is there any viable scientific hypothesis uh, ever put forward for gravity? gravity? And backed by uh, hypothesis, it's like hypothesis test. He said, Jay, there's loads. I said, from who? Nothing. <laughs> I mean, quick change of subject. You know? So according to some of them, there's loads. Then the Cavendish thing came out, which is uh, nonsense. But I put that to bed. But which leads that, on to the... That's, what, that's what's going on there. That. Which leads on to the next so, question, which sorry. is why... 
any scientific evidence for gravity has been expanded into any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology or astrophysics, because none exist. They don't have any science. It's all pseudoscience. Exactly. And somehow the Cavendish experiment weighed the Earth, right? Is that what they're, is that the paradigm? That was its original the intention. Of the Earth by the experiment. That was its original intention, yes, to weigh Earth. And then derive... Yeah, I, I asked what... It... Go on. The density of the Earth. Yeah, I, I asked them, I asked uh, what was the naturally observed phenomenon. And uh, I don't remember exactly what I got, but it wasn't anything substantial. Do we list oh, off a couple? A naturally observed phenomena. The, you right. ask for the, the natural phenomena in Cavendish, because you yeah. typically on the, the route of establishing what the cause and effect is, IVDB relationship, formulated hypothesis, actualization, and the first step is, what's the phenomena? And you can have a, a couple, right? Normally, you'll go immediately with the globe head. This is off the rails so far, it's untrue, which is to say you get something like apple falling from tree as the observed phenomena, right? Or you get the actual observed contraption phenomena, in quotes, <laughs> which would be torsion bar twist. Or there's a third they just beg the question, which is, they say gravity. They just say gravity, which you're not observing. It's weird that they would even call it an experiment from the gate, because the, if he was trying to measure the density of the Earth, the, that's not an experiment. That's not a cause and effect relationship. That's just measuring the density. That's maths, <coughs> right. And what that's he, what they what do. Doing? <laughs> Spot on. They haven't got a phenomena. Doing a bit of maths with a bit of equipment, calling it an experiment, claiming scientific validity when they make up a massive just so story. You know, they need a lot of equipment to make that look valid, and that's precisely what they've done. They still teach it in colleges, it's amazing. But without gravity, how could Cavendish have possibly met, weighed the earth in his experiment? It's not an experiment, so there's no observed phenomena. It's ch 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 chocolate. Is Chocolate's mic working? Did, am I just hearing things? Is it because he's not actually yeah, yeah. here and I've got his voice in my head, the voice of reason, chocolate swirling around in my head? No, it's working. I heard it. <laughs> he just explained this. There's, there's no phenomena, Arwin. <laughs> I know, but I asked, uh, but how then could you? You know? And your answer was, yeah, you can. Yeah, you're right. Oh, right. So so how could my unicorn weighing machine work if there wasn't any unicorns? I mean, come exactly. on. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if there was any assumptions in calculations going. of the density of the Earth. Was there any assumptions? Uh, what, like assuming gravity itself? Or anything. Assuming maybe the radius, assuming maybe gravity, maybe assume what any assumptions. What, All of the what above. is officially the All of the above. Of the they're assuming mass attracts mass. They're assuming Earth has a, a sphere radius. Yeah, they're assuming all of that, Paul. Or, or was that the reason you asked? Yeah, that's the reason I asked. So if there's any assumptions, and you know what, when, when you assume things, what it, what it does, they might know what, when you assume things. Makes an ass of you and me. Yep, you got it. <laughs> hey. Uh, question, guys, and to you too, Nathan. Like, what is the supposed weight of the Earth? You know, and how did they come to that number specifically? You know, it's supposed to be, yeah, it's a mock up experiment, whatever, to weigh it, but they calculate something. But isn't it just like the distance to the sun? Basically, an arbitrary number that, that is set the weight of the Earth? They got it what through Cavendish. It? I'm not being funny, Arwin. Are you hungover or something? We, we're literally talking nope. about exactly that right now. You, you do realise that, right? Yeah. That, that's what they did. They claimed Cavendish did that. That's what they did to weigh the Earth. Cavendish. Right. But what is the number? What is the supposed number of that weight? You, you, are you asking me to Google search the weight of the Earth? Can you not do this after housekeeping? <laughs> okay, I can do it right now. Okay. 
Wait a minute, but don't you, wait, before you say something is weighing something, don't you have to define what you're doing? So what is weight? Or what is oh, mass? Wow. I see where you're going now. Right. So you'd need to understand what, if you're trying to establish the mass of something, you have to define what mass is. Is that, is that where you're going, Paul? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going that direction. So what is mass? What is weight? Undefined, unfortunately, Paul. So you, you find me a, def a definition of mass. You won't. It's undefined. Wow, they have a density for Earth now. That's like, does that include all the gas sticking to it? or No, but it's helpful to know how much water you'd need if we've got a giant glass. <laughs> right. Right, so let's just, just a couple of more things, because we've said that, you know, because there's assumptions being made in regards to mass that, you know, you can't have assumptions. And a hypothesis is, is a supposition. It's an assumption of the cause of an effect, which is why hypotheses on their own are useless, meaningless nonsense. It's only upon actualization of the hypothesis, which is to say that your assumption, this will cause that. Well, you've got to vary what you think will cause it and show that it does actually cause it. I actualize your assumption. So at hypothesis stage in the scientific method, you do have an assumption, an assumed cause of the effect, but you're going to validate that. That's the point of science. That's why it's empirical. You'll prove or disprove that which you have assumed in the hypothesis. So the supposition stage of science is still absolutely required, but to just have the assumption or define some of your terms like mass with only the assumption standing true is where you don't have your validity that you'd require with the empiricism validating an assumption, singular, independent, one, on its own, variable. Varying that which you assume is what you get to cause the effect, then you've validated your hypothesis. It's no longer an assumption, it's validated. Anyway, I just wanted to clear that up. The po whole point of this is we don't, have, we don't have a phenomena in Cavendish. They're not observing anything at step one and saying, hey, what causes that? They're saying, how much does the Earth weigh? Well, that's not a cause and effect relationship, as Chocolate pointed out earlier. Well, and also remember, in any scientific endeavor, you've got to rigor rigorously define your terms. Because if you say something does something, you've got to ri have rigorously defined what that term is or what that thing is, correct? Absolutely. You, you can't have, in the case of mass, an equivocation fallacy being utilized. You know, the def definition being the same as mole. And even though it's, you know, the, what is it, the Royal Society for Chemistry making it clear that it's falsely identified as the amount of matter being mass, and that's incorrect, you know, then you go on normally. I don't know why it always happens like clockwork, but you'll ask someone to identify what mass is. They'll tell you it's the amount of stuff, the amount of stuff in something. When you point out that's not mass, because it's falsely being identified and cited with the Royal Society for Chemistry, they'll then go on, almost in the next breath, to define inertia. I, don't, I, I always think when, when Quantum Eraser taught me that, I was like, yeah, but it's going to be unlikely that they'll immediately just define inertia straight after. But there hasn't been a time that they haven't. It's happened every time. And as soon as they do, you're like, well, that's an equivocation fallacy. We're supposed to have rigorously defined terms. We've got two definitions for the same thing in quick succession, normally within the next breath. Right, just do a quick super chat shout out. Shout out to Truth In Your Face. He's also got a channel, so subscribe today. Debunking Newton, Apple falls down, then entropy kicks in is and is left over at a period of time. The apple becomes gas, which goes up. So Newton's apple goes down and up. Right on. Thank you very much indeed for your super chat. Truth In Your Face. Roscoe, if you want to check uh, out his channel. That, that brings up something else Sanic said, just, just so you know. You know, he was saying that it's the weight of the water that keeps the water in the glass. But is that what keeps it in the glass over time? Because over time, entropy takes takes hold and the water evaporates and goes up. Builds exactly. available volume. Yeah, entropy is a bitch. It's absolute. There's no overcoming entropy. So even if you're going to assert the force of gravity, this is where Sleeping Warrior used to get annoyed at me and Quantum Eraser. Have it. Have your gravity. Have it a hundred times the force. It's still not going to overcome entropy, though, is it? As demonstrated by Paul's example with a glass of water. You leave it on the side, you come back a couple of weeks later, it's all gone. Oh, has it been held there with gravity? Nah. Entropy has taken hold and it's filled the available volume. 
as you've had a phase transition slowly occurring the entire time that it's there, change has happened, entropy. Yeah, <laughs> Paul's absolutely right. It's gone up. Got a couple more housekeeping questions. See if we can keep them in the hour. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? No. No? Is that it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes you get a, a can answer to that. Any evidence of no, the... No, uh, no. Go on, George. Go on. I always hold out hope for this question. No, 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 not at all. Uh, we're actually studying uh, that subject at the moment with my kids, and it, it's funny, but yeah, we need to keep it in the paradigm, unfortunately. Uh, how disappointing. Any evidence of the R value, Earth radius? Black swan. You got something up, Arwen? Did you want me to present something? Oh no, I was still stuck to the weight of the Earth and then was kind of astounded how the other planets supposedly have their weights referenced in amounts of Earth weight with a special symbol. Like 5.972 yeah. times 10 to the 24 kilograms. It's like, oh really? How did they confirm this? I, 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 someone slap him. <laughs> We've just been discussing it for 25 straight minutes. I know. And it's not because I'm having a hangover. It's just because I want to be like that. You want to be like what? I don't know. Just looking into this shit. Fair enough. Just being astounded how much of this is out there and just accept it. And then wondering how many people looking upon that will wonder how they actually got to those numbers. Not many. Before JLB covered it, as a flat earther, I hadn't got any clue. And then JLB, who wasn't then and still is not a flat earther, covered the fact that they're nonsense about how they weighed the earth. And then um, I think it was Tiger Dan took the concept and, and made a video referencing John Le Bon, where he got like that Spanish guy with the horrible teeth laughing really like, <laughs> and talking about how the cult had had him. And how they had these magic balls that they said they could weigh the earth with. Ha, ha, ha. But now he's left the cult. Well, that that was, um, like I say, that was my first exposure to what even Cavendish was. Well, obviously, there's people like Adam that have gone far further in university. And have gone, no, that was something I was taught when I was doing science. Right. And, but according to Adam, he's like, but the professor says, yeah, it never works. Don't worry about it. This is what you need to write down to pass. <laughs> don't worry about the actual <laughs> experiment it doesn't never work <laughs> nice any evidence that you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon the gradient uh, Red 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 has a video so. oh too many answers I believe there's evidence for gas pressure without containment May we have this conversation? Hey, we are having this conversation. <laughs> okay. Well, here goes. Just a couple of days ago, we spoke about the phase transition in water and how the water evaporates, goes up to the clouds and collects and drops back down. But at the same okay. time, Here's if we could, we could, what's going on with Alexa, Alexa over there? I don't know. <laughs> Alexa's trying to debate. <laughs> get My bad. Alexa. Nobody I've had said it myself. nothing to Alexa, and she just jumped in and started talking. I, I get it anyway. sometimes. I'll be full on in, you know, rah, rah, and then suddenly Siri will pipe up. Anyway, feel free. We've got, yeah, we got about 30 seconds left. Alexa, what's the evidence? Let's just shut up. You've got about 30 seconds left before I round out the live show. Go ahead. All right. So if we take, if we go into a laboratory and recreate a container and we put gas pressure into it, we would, we realize that the gas pressure is going to build up in there. And the only way for us to maintain a pressure gradient 
is with a pressure relief valve at the top that leads out to a less pressurized medium. So if here in our experience, our gas, the gas pressure that we have isn't pressing off anything from the top, what explains that? Yeah, very good question. What's it pressing on at the top? Without the container, there can be no pressure. And with that, I'll say, if you are watching this on the Nathan Oakley premiering stream, then stay tuned, as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you're watching this live on the Nathan Oakley 1980 channel, this is where we bid you farewell. A huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, and all that good stuff. Of course, a massive thank you to today's Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on the Nathan Oakley premiering stream. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video. So when they start talking about the even when they start talking about the hydrological cycle, you can't have liquid water without pressure. And every vacuum chamber that you put water in, when you evacuate the air, what happens to the water? It boils away. So you got to have pressure to have liquid water. So even hydrological hydrological cycle, you need pressure. Exactly, Paul. Resistance. Thank you for your super chat, DJ Neo Shaman. Basically, Paul, what you're saying is we couldn't have water if we didn't have the amount of pressure we have at ground level. You couldn't have liquid. I'm oh, sorry. You couldn't have liquid water or ice without pressure. Yeah. And without the container, there can be no pressure. I like shows like that. Housekeeping takes the entire hour, so it's like a staggered explanation, although we didn't cover any Black Swan. Like, Curvature was like, nope, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I have something on the Black Swan. Oh, you made my day. Go ahead. Uh, I talked to QE a little bit about it, the uh, refracted horizon claim. Um, when you're looking at something that's refracted, it, the light to it has changed angles. Does, does everybody agree on that? Yeah, deviated from straight, correct. Well, when we use the autolites uh, to look at the horizon, we get an angle to it. Does anybody disagree with that? Nope. So how can the angle change and the angle not change simultaneously? Correct. If you're going to be drawing a tangent to what's claimed to be a physical geometric sphere edge horizon to perform geometry, you will require a straight line. If the line is refracted between you and what is claimed to be a physical sphere edge horizon, formerly known as Earth curve, then you can't because you haven't. In other words, if the line is bent, it's not straight. Simple. You can't do geometry. And in your question, is the unravelling of the globe model? It's geometric. And they haven't got a straight line for a tangent. Something that is absolutely necessitated if you're doing geometry. But, but come on, Nathan. I'll, I'm going to play Ed, because Ed was saying, was it last week, that I know the refractive index, so I can actually technically take that curved line and straighten it because I know the refractive index. That's what it is. You just don't know. No, that, that goes to my claim. That goes to my claim because if the horizon is changing angles, the horizon must visually change angles, not just mathematically. That's correct. The apparent position, because every horizon is apparent, will move. That's correct. 
Therefore, if you're claiming it's physical and you're drawing an angle to it, then you can't. Correct. But refraction is something that happens to physical objects because of light affecting how you're viewing them. But the horizon is a visual effect. It's not a physical object. There's nothing physical about the horizon. So it's again, impossible for it to refract again, because in, it's not it, physical. Precisely. And in your deep, in your concise words is the unravelling of the heliocentric model. Because by nature, the horizon is very obviously not physical. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. We're detailing how it moves and changes position. It's obviously not a physical location. Yeah, it is in their sphere model. It's marked with an X labeled horizon. They're doing geometry to it. It's based on the R value. It is a physical sphere edge horizon, formerly known as Earth curve, that blocks buildings and boats go over. Now, obviously, we don't have a physical horizon. That's why it's the end of the globe model, because that's what's required to do geometry. Well, in some ways, remember, they used to try to assert it, because at some point, Zanning had me asking him, can I get a, an address to the horizon? Can I get a P.O. box? Is there a way I can get there? And he was basically telling me, yeah, pretty much, <laughs> you can get there. Like, how do you get an apparent an position. <laughs> Ahead, how do you how do you get an angle on a curved line? Can somebody please walk me through that? Well, you're describing a tangent in geometry. If you're drawing a line, a straight line, that's what a tangent is, to a point that meets the curve. That's the tangent point that you'd be describing in geometry. But they don't have any straight lines. Everything's refracted. Bye bye, globe geometry. You don't have a physical sphere edge horizon. You can call Earth curve and claim it blocks things and draw straight lines to it. Because you don't have any. Black Swan. Yeah. It is the best argument to date. What is it, five years in this subject? I don't know how long. Chocolate and Arwen, you're probably the longest standing, are you not? Yep. No. I started coming here, I, I think it was 2017. So Arwen's definitely long in the, longer in the tooth than you. But either yeah, way. I oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I was there at the beginning. Well, in all that time, the Black Swan definitely the number one argument yeah I, i've been flat out on now since 2015 and i'm listening to the show since sometime around 2016 um and i didn't hear it. there's no argument better than that uh, the gas pressure argument uh, that's kind of on power but uh, you know it, it, it's so easy to prove for any normal person you know that's the thing about it Hey, chocolate, are you available? You know what? Oh, all right. Chocolate. Yes, sir. What's up, man? Uh, I don't frequent the other shows as much as I know you do. Has anyone grabbed the Black Swan argument the way Nathan show has? And uh, are any other flat earth stations or are they as hot as we she are? It, or how are they treating it? Yeah, well, uh, uh on 24-7. QE, uh, Flat Earth Discord, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. They, they, a lot of the guys over there have taken this argument. destroyed. Yeah, them. a lot of them do. That's true. Yeah, man. Is Kimo still here? Yeah. Kimo's got, she's got the right end of the stick immediately, and he's like, surely everyone gets this by now. He's only naive about how other people don't get it, because he's well on top of it. I quite frequently, Spurs Kimo puts out, um, Under No Pressure, his show's called, and he puts out clips all the time of him absolutely obliterate. I love them. He annihilates people. And he's good at leading people as well. And he's so... Oh, I don't know if coy is the right word as he does it. I think it is the right word. You know, he doesn't... He doesn't. He leads them in a way that they're, they're totally oblivious to what Spurs is doing. He eggs them on a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's just great. I like I like Spurs doing it. I like watching him use the black swan. But I've certainly seen others do it. There's plenty of people out there using this argument. 
they're still arguing that there's refraction on the on the crane arms of the uh, platforms in Jose's. <laughs> And that's since the weekend. Yeah. I heard it. They're still arguing. It's like they're not getting just, this. Just a few more months before they understand the actual argument. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the platforms. We're talking about the horizon. That's just some okay. thermal occurrences because the heat and I mean that's normal. Tenth, tenth man, just just tell me. I'll just make a statement, and we're not finished making the statement. Tell me how many times I mention oil rigs or anything of that sort of nature. If the Earth is a sphere with a radius of 39.59 miles, then every distance to horizon measurement must be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet. That's the argument. How many oil cranes were mentioned in that argument? None. It was looming. It, it, I could say it was a uh, well hold on, said hold on, argument. Hold on. Hold on. Say that again, Alwyn. It was looming. Ah, so no longer geometric then, as required by the geometric physical sphere edge model and assumption that we have a physical sphere edge blocking boats and buildings that we can draw a straight tangent line to. Refracted, you say? Not geometric, you say? Welcome to Flat Earth. Okay, Nathan, let me here poison the well for a second. What if the apparent horizon that we see is not really a horizon, it just is an apparent Apparent horizon. Number one, all and it's horizons actually are actually looming. Number as one, part of all the objects, it just seems to be like a horizon. The a horizon you know. is a visual chocolate. You there? Let him have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Arwen, come on, man. <laughs> it's not hey, a horizon just... if you don't see it. <laughs> no, but look, the horizon is basically not... effectively oh. comprised of visuals. So it's like a rainbow, visual land, land, right? Visual in some way. We need so. To see it. Thanks. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> devil where the, where the sky, where uh, the sky seems to make uh, the don't, ocean. Don't run past him, he's got a gag. Really ah, ah, like everyone, hello. Hello, can you clear the airwaves? Let Arwin make his gag. He's got a gag. Let him do it. Right, so what if uh, the apparent horizon in the picture is not really the horizon because the entire thing is loomed around the... A cornered sphere of the earth and so you're in the picture not looking at the horizon it just appears like it is a horizon because it is part of the entire apparent landmass reflection of the original horizon that's completely out of view because oh. of the entire oh, no. <laughs> when does this word salad looming. have an end <laughs> no, but that word excludes looming. the horizon from being part of the looming itself it just looks like. Oh, that sucks because we were talking about the horizon. Yeah, well, that goes, there's something <laughs> sorry, to that though because you never see the horizon above your head. Uh, no. I don't know. What well, if you're lying on the beach, right? And you know you're lying on your back, and then you lean backwards to look at the horizon. Ninety degrees from the surface. When Zenith. you're standing plumb, you never yeah. see the horizon above so, your I'm head. I'm just being a prick, Zenith. At your zenith. You never see a horizon at your zenith. Right. Not just well, that, like five degrees Michael's up. Be... Not, like people don't see that. But, but refraction would dictate that that would be changing. That would, it would how be bad for artillery your, and everything too, on, wouldn't it? How can oh you would God. never be how able to hit on your back and then lean back? Object. Say that again. How can you lie on your back and lean back? Lie on your back, right, and then just tip your neck back a bit, and then roll your eyes back a bit further, and you'll see the horizon above your head, right? You, you ain't lean. You'd have to arch your neck. You ain't leaning back against the ground. Yeah, you are. You just—that's right. just semantics. Lean back. That's you just semantics. You can press a little bit more and say. You guys are red herring my argument. I think he said quantum mechanics are your eyes in your head, and you thought he said the horizon. No, that's just words that disagree with and contradict my argument. That's all that is. Just semantics. At best, you've disproven <laughs> just it. Hey, Nathan, check your Skype messages. The last message for me, please. Okie dokie. Is it a, a clip? Let's hope so. I'd By say the way, so. Nathan. Uh, no, no, it's fair. No, no. I'd like to read this out because I got this wrong the other day. Hold on one second. So... Yeah, I, I kept on using the wrong term, the wrong fallacy. So I kept on saying, you're using an equivocation fallacy. 
and an equivocation fallacy is having two or more different definitions for a single term in the same argument. That would be the equivocation of, say, mass as the amount of matter in something and inertia. That's an equivocation fallacy. Now, a law of identity violation is two different terms with the same definition. Now, that would be the example of um, Zanuck, which I can't now remember what he actually did. Oh, yes, it, it, Coriolis effect being the same as the conservation of momentum. Well, no, that's a law of identity violation. It can't be, it, one thing cannot be both the, the conservation of momentum and Coriolis effect. So I kept on calling it an equivocation fallacy. It's actually a law of identity violation. Thank you for dropping that in the chat. Really appreciate it. Nathan, on your question to me a, a minute, a few minutes ago about when you read the modus tollens, could I spot any oil wells or anything? Remember that? If the Earth is a sphere with a radius of 39.59, then every distance to horizon must be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet. No oil platforms yes. mentioned. Well, it was, well, part of it is true because it was a well formed argument. <laughs> <laughs> A well-formed yeah, argument. <laughs> Everybody missed it the first time. I missed it, it the first time as well. <laughs> Excellent. Chocolate. I got to drill down until I get it. Oh, God. No, don't, don't take it further. You won. You <laughs> don't ruin it. <laughs> I had to drill down further. That's such Everybody real seems either. to have forgotten my argument. Your, your word salad went on for about four minutes, Arwin. No, it's not. You can call it a word salad, but I actually had a well-developed train of thought behind it. But everybody started rumpusing me. So, yeah, I know it's a joke, right? But it doesn't mean that I didn't think this one out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but remember what happened to Tycho Brahe when he made a joke? They took Ta him serious. And they made a story right. there. Tycho Brahe. Be careful what you tell him. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that's why I said, okay, I hope you enjoy the next rumpus argument in the coming month. Because that's probably what it's going to become. Tycho Brahe had two horizons also. So he was just utilizing the exact same magic trick. What you call the sensible or true or astronomical horizon, 90 degrees from your zenith, is an imaginary location that they just draw a line out to. Well, they're calling that a horizon. And then what do you know? What you take into account when you're using a theodolite to account for dip is what they're actually measuring. So their horizon dip measurement is utilizing an apparent location, which is the horizon we see, or is claimed to have been seen by Al Biruni up his mountain, and comparing it to his 90 degrees from his zenith. That's all he's doing. He's creating another horizon to derive a geometric horizon from that horizon. Then the derived horizon utilizing his 90 degree zenith and his dip value gives you what ends up being the R-based value that gives you your geometric horizon that then doesn't exist from then on in. It becomes an imaginary horizon, one that doesn't mm. exist beyond the model. And then the horizon we see is the apparent horizon when you're arguing at trench level, but defined, specifically defined in all of the textbooks as a geometric horizon. In other words, it doesn't go beyond Al Biruni's assertion that the horizon he saw was a physical sphere edge. That's the rhetoric. That's their religion. They've mm -hmm. taken it one step further here in the trenches to say, no, 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 it's a refracted horizon. We derive the geometric horizon from that. It's a third step. Well, no, that's just an invented step they've created here at trench level. Right. And I've kind of tried to improve upon that trench level by saying, no, it's not a horizon. It just looks like a horizon, but it's all part of an image of actual physical things being loomed up in a giant amount. And yeah, the preponderance of all that together makes it seem like you're looking at a horizon, but it's not. That is their argument. That is their rebuttal. No, but they still the call it a horizon. You've, all you've done is paraphrase their actual be, rebuttal, Arwin. Yeah, horizon. Just paraphrase their actual I, rebuttal. Oh, I've been saying that. <laughs> it's not a horizon if you don't see it. But that right. contradicts They've the They've been telling us they don't see the geometric horizon. It's impossible to see because we no, have was, an atmosphere. No, I was talking about that, the apparent changed, horizon. Yeah. The one you see in visuals. Yeah, the That's horizon. what I'm saying. That that yeah. one you, is you not wrong, in the horizon. You have to define looming. You're using looming out of... I don't, I, what the hell is looming? 
visually displaying objects, not horizons. Oh, that's a problem then, right? For the horizon. Visual displaying <laughs> objects. No, 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 you're not listening. I know you're all I listened. To I get it. Have I, been I, saying Arwen, let me summarize. Year. I don't want to. Arwen, Arwin, 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 Arwin. I mean, I it's get it. not what I'm saying. Oh, God, he's doing a proper rumpus number on us. No, yeah, I get what you're saying. Me oh. as I try to carefully Jesus, explain Arwen, hello. Just because you're taking the globe bed stance doesn't mean you have to rumpus us. Fine. Oh. Yeah, we get it. You're saying, no, what we're seeing isn't the physicality of what is in existence. It's something that's projected up. That's the actual rebuttal they give us. But that leaves them in a position where, number one, there's a second horizon you're asserting that we don't see. Therefore, it's not a horizon. You've just ignored chocolate about four times. And secondly, you don't have a straight line anymore, you're saying. It's a bent line to the horizon. So, what? No geometry. So, it, you're screwed on two counts. It is actually just a rendition of their crap rebuttal, are we? Not necessarily. <laughs> you are I'm not saying you don't see the real physical actual They've horizon. They've got to him. It's, it's, it's just pretty over. much... As part of the whole display, it's n just not recognizable. And it's not loomed. No, the horizon isn't loomed. What's in, looming? In that conceptualization. That's Are what I'm saying. There is no horizon being For the loomed. tenth time, what is looming? Looming is a form of visual displacement, as it were, of sight. Of no, physical it's not. Things. No, it's not. No, it's not. Really, it's not the, appear the appearance of an object that should be below the horizon above it. No, that's wrong, also. That's wrong, too. That's it's, their definition, but that's try. wrong, too. I'm looking for the yeah. actual definition. Oh, your oh, definition? No, no, no. <laughs> the actual definition. Yeah, I guess it's my definition. Yes, it's a mirage of the sky to create a false horizon below the horizon. Yeah. Creating the yeah. impression of objects on the horizon to be floating, when in reality it's just a mirage of the sky, creating a second false horizon. Yep. Yeah, but aren't we using their nonsense to destroy them? No, not yet. Hold on, Owen! Yes. At that point, you wouldn't use this argument, you're right. What you'd do is you'd say, hold on, looming? What an actual effect of refraction? No, 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 no. Your refraction's terrestrial refraction. Well, then, yeah, um, then but, you bust out the, the actual angle definition. doesn't change, so the, the point is most. Then you bust out the actual, in reality, definition of looming, what it actually is. Right. Well, at this point, I'm not going by their machinations at all. I'm really going from ground up scratch, trying to redo it and bypassing all of that machination nonsense that they let slip, slip in. Turning the whole thing into a double speak soup. I'm <laughs> I'm trying to actually reconstruct something in a somewhat apparent si way that seems a little bit more logical. Well, go ahead and draw it for us. Sure. Do, do it for tomorrow. Go ahead and draw it because it's it's hard to that. visualize what you're in words. So draw it, right? Right. Well, I can draw it. Hold on, I can I can do it for him. He's got a donkey dick horizon. That's all he's got. He's got two <laughs> horizons, one with a bent line to it, the other one that we can't see. He's just given us their crappy rebuttal. Did anybody see the uh, demonstration Al K tried to use to prove his crap? Al K, what a fucking retard, man. <laughs> that dude, he couldn't right. tie his shoes. <laughs> they just slobber nurses. But the angle to his bottle horizon changed from the viewing angle. That that doesn't happen ever. But that's stupid. That was stupid. Very useful I, for me to make my point, though. I trimmed out that. Thanks. Thanks, LK. Did you do? Did you do one with LK? Yeah, I nicked his bit where he stuck a white bottle into a, some water. I think it was in Oh reference. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, go. Yeah. He's been quite he's good though. He's out there. He does stuff. So I've used his examples a few times. There was once where he got miraging on the bottom bumpers of cars as he was going up and down hills at full zoom. So he'd set up a full on tripod in his car and driven along with a decent enough camera to <laughs> <laughs> no, but it showed the angle closing. Obviously, as the car's going up the hill, 
and it reaches the apex of the hill and he's below it he's got the angle closing and then you get this like mirror of the bumper on the road and it happened consistently as he's traveling along sod all to do with atmosphere he's only a, you know a few hundred yards away from the car in front but you still got the exact same effect we get at the horizon and it's just down to a limitation of the angle okay all this guy's good for is color commentaries about the situation with flat earthers yeah give us another incoherent color commentary you freaking bozo lk drink another one why don't you snort the next beer it's yeah but what i was saying about his you know incoherent piehole crap is that the angle to the horizon on the bottle changed it doesn't change in real life to our horizon. It does. <laughs> yeah, it does. It depends on the weather. Yeah. No, no. But it, does the horizon appear five degrees up or down from its previous position? I don't know about, I, I don't know about qualifying in degrees, but yeah. Not up. This one is beyond. See, the you got to get the different definitions define above and then define beyond it's right higher. if you take They're a two-dimensional picture of it it's higher in frame it'll appear higher it's not higher it's just appears uh, or lower i qualified it in the two-dimensional picture that you observe if you were to compare them one would be higher in frame than the other Show us. Just put them side by side. One's got that it's higher on one than the other. I thought <laughs> you just repeated your claim. Show us. I'll go and get a side by side. I can't do it on spot while I'm running a recording of a show. But I'll go and yeah, get a side by side. Was, that was unfair. <laughs> I'll go and, and I'll do it for you though. I'll get a side by side of two different um images that are at the same height from BLMSB sixty nine, and you'll just see that one's higher in frame than the other. That said, I'm never gonna satisfy you because how can I prove that they're both exactly the same? I can't, can I? Right. So, based on that, I've just undone my own argument. I'll relinquish what I've just claimed. Fine. <laughs> yeah, they only appear that way. I still st still think this I had an argument. Hold on, Arwen's going to take this as a win for him somehow. Go ahead, Arwen. Yes, <laughs> see? The ballers were always right. You were always wrong because you just made a mistake. Uh, I didn't make a mistake. Did. I conceded that I couldn't demonstrate it. Therefore, it's a baseless assertion. I didn't say I was wrong. Okay, now I made a mistake proving that the ballers were always right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where's Rumpus when you need him? He might be here. Let's have a look. Shady Meadows. Could I share something in a minute? I said, where's a lobotomy when you need one? <laughs> I've never said that. <laughs> but I share something in a dip minute, angle if it's always That's moving up and down. Hold on one second. Brian's trying to get a word in. Go ahead, go ahead Brian. Yeah, could I share something uh, in a word? When you, no, you can't. Mo moving on. <laughs> go ahead, Brian. Whatever you like. What, can I comment on chocolates? Ah, what's going on? Go ahead, Brian. What? Uh, oh. uh, I do have to add a hint to his comment. I, I should just... Hey, yeah, chocolate. What was your statement about lobotomy? <laughs> well, Arwen said, "Where's a rumpus when you need one?" I said, "I've never asked. Where's a lobotomy when you need one?" Well, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like saying, "Where's a massive headache when you need one?" Right, Brian. I think we're done with the gags. Okay. I <laughs> I just want to share uh, share something here uh, that I showed the weekend, and I had to do it kind of in a subtle way, so it wasn't stopped. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just something about perspective. That's all. Okay. Oh. Yeah, ready when you are. Got some okay. Lo looming. I oh, know. Okay. Um, here, I, if you can all see my screen, I have these pitted green olive jars. I have one here in front of us and one at the back, it's hard to see. And next to that, I have a salt shaker, uh, a sea salt shaker. And the sea salt shaker is actually higher than the olive jars by about an inch or three quarter of an inch. <clears throat> now, this is just the first one, the first uh, frame here is just to show 
uh, the uh, difference in angular size change is just to show that they are exactly the same jars. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so my next one, this is what I did. I put the center uh, of the center frame just underneath the black cap. So to show, because why I did this is that, is that I had an argument with that surveyor, Jesse Kozwalski before, because he was saying that because a pole he, yeah, <laughs> a pole he had set up uh, at the same height as, as his yep. theod, theod like seven miles away across a lake or something, had gotten lower than his center frame, than, than his crosshairs. So that was the cover of the earth. And I said, no, it's angular size change. And I spent four days arguing with him, uh, with him and he eventually admitted that he hadn't taken angular size change into account. Okay, so I showed this on Fight the Flat Out show there, and, I, and they were like, yeah, yeah, but that could be just that it's not level. Like, it's not level, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I said, like, okay, the floor is not level, and that's why it's the 3.6 here from left to right, but forward to back, my phone is my phone is up against the, the, the olive jar. I said, this is angular, angular size change. And yeah. I, I showed more, I showed don't, here. Don't. What? Don't take that off frame. Don't take that off frame. I'd like to comment on that after me you're too. done, please. Thank yeah, you. me too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, too. well, uh, you can comment now if you want, John, and I'll move on then. And me. Jesse, Jesse Kozlowski, Messy Jesse, you're c trying to come back in here again. I handed you your ass about three and a half years ago on your own channel, right? Over science. Do you remember that? You little clown show. Now, look at Brian's shot right here. Where'd it go? There it is. It Hold on. Get on screen. This implodes your entire fairy tale right here in three seconds. You bozo. You got me, messy <laughs> Jesse. Just I'll catch you out here again, sir. I'll tell you what, you're gonna rue the day. Got me, Sally. Oh, that's off. Uh, oh, this on, is Paul, also on, good for Xanax Mountain View. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay, hold on. This is a cue. <laughs> right. So, is that a car in the background behind that uh, behind that French window? Yeah, it's it's, it's, uh, it's if, the, just, okay. the front of a car. Yeah, this this it's a white or whatever color it is. This car, yeah. Yeah. If that was next to <laughs> where this pickle jar is, right? How high do you reckon the roof would be? Oh, we'd be looking at this side of the tire. You couldn't see the roof at all. You mean? Yeah. So. <laughs> As you move the car away, the roof's getting closer and closer to the centre point. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, uh, and the, and the, light, the lamp out there, that's about 24 foot up. At the no, back window. But, hold on. A... No, 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 can't possibly be. It's lower than the frame of the door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's so curve of the be... earth right. Hold on. That's curve of the yeah. earth right there. See that lamppost? <laughs> the only reason it's lower than the door frame? Curve of the earth. <laughs> So well, this is funny. Go ahead, Paul. Now this is funny because uh, Xanax been posting that mountain view picture. Remember those mountains? He says that the mountains are kind of, uh, you know, lower or whatever because of curvature of the earth. This would account for that as well, in his because perspective, and this would account for it right off the bat. So, yeah, great job, Brian. It's such a shame there's no perspective in their geometric begging the question proof of nothing curve calculator. You know, and a shame they need a tangent line. There's a lot of shames for their model that's dead. But there we go. It's a dead model. Who cares? Do you still have that picture up of that of the olive jars? Yeah, it's still up there. Yeah. Yeah. I have more to show. So, so any fence sitters out there, see what they're doing. These friggin' numpty dipshits. They're saying that you see those crosshairs right there. What they're saying is when they shoot that, when they're looking out through their theodolite, and they're putting center mass on an object that's real close and they take it further away from them, that since the, the crosshairs appear higher, they don't stay center mass, that the earth is curved. Can you believe that? Grown it, adults tell you this. That's really what this argument, because I, I had to kind of dip for a few minutes. Is that what this is about? Yes. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Okay. This was the first time. <laughs> it's I, hilarious. I thought it was hilarious. The first I laughed the first time I was exposed to this argument. It was Jaronism that exposed it. It was the same dude. Jesse Kazowski. He's got his two different lantern things set across a river, a, a lake. Sorry, and uh, he's explaining that because the one is lower in the crosshairs, it's because of the curve of the Earth. But before he gets to say that, because I hadn't seen the original video, I was watching Jaronism's commentary on it. He goes, the reason it's dropped in the crosshairs is because cut to black and Jaronism goes perspective and it made me it made me laugh because mm -hmm. I thought yeah obviously yeah wow. I had no idea this was a real argument <laughs> yeah it's yeah, been yeah. from you <laughs> off, absolutely technically, technically the actual if it's straight line there is actually down here technically uh, it just appears that it's up here but technically yeah, it's down here tune parrots this nonsense too Mr. Bozo himself. Same argument. Okay, right. Brian's still in the middle of his presentation, so do you want to carry Sorry on, Brian? About that, Brian? No, no, that's fine. That's what I want. This is what I want. They're talking about it and people are saying about it. Yeah, that's this is good. Uh, so what I did is is I took another shot from just above it. Now, that red salt shaker, uh, it's a sea salt shaker, that's higher by about three quarters of an inch than any of these olive jars, and you can't see it at the background there. You should see red up over here. Uh, and you can't see it. You can't. Now I, I'm looking right here. That's almost the end of the radiator there. You can't see it at all. Uh, and I move on, and I take another one here, close to the jar, right up next to it. And I brought brought the other olive jar closer, and you can still see that that actual red salt shaker is slightly higher. It's just almost at the top, or slightly higher than the than this olive jar here, uh, or almost same height. But I brought this olive jar closer, and I got closer to this here, right at the center of the cap. Bought olive jars, and it still shows that it's the crosshairs appear as higher, just appear as higher. So then I did it again at the bottom uh, of the jar, uh, of the lid of the jar, with the with the other one closer again, just to show that it's still higher. It just not really higher; it just appears that way. So what? I, what? So that was like ah yeah yeah, but you'd have to make sure your floor is. This is what I, this is what I got. You have to make sure your floor is level, and you know, you know, you have to make sure your phone is level. Like that's not level. It's like yeah, it's not level from left to right because that's the floor. But it's level. I mean, I mean, I can't move the camera forward and back because I have it up against the jar. So it's like, it, it, like it is, it's level with the jar. If you know what I'm saying, it, it, as in, like using a, clon a clinometer, you, you know, I can't move it forward and back. But as in, yeah, tilt it. I can't tilt the camera because uh, <clears throat> it's against the jar. So. It is what it is. It's just a perspective. So they kind of weren't. They were kind of like, ah, yeah, yeah. And because I was kind of bringing it to them in a nice way, they were just kind of going, ah, yeah. And they weren't really hand wave dismissing it, but they weren't taking it serious. So then I went on to this. I said, well, I'm just going to show something else here. Uh, this is this is the exact same thing in an actual real photograph that we all know, right? And I went to this. So Miles Davis's camera height was 210 meters. The center stanchion on this bridge is 210 meters. Now, technically, his center camera, his center frame should be right at the top of this bridge stanchions here. At uh, this one, because the boy exactly the same height on this in, in this shot. He was 210 meters high, and the, the bridge stanchion in the middle is 210 meters high. So technically, the center of, of his frame should be aligning up with this. And what I got for it was, well, you see, that was a a, 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 like a, a screenshot taken out of a bigger expanse of a photograph. I said, exactly, I said, things get smaller with distance. I said, at a distance, if you look at the full photograph, when he was actually just not zoomed in and this wasn't taken out from a 25 mile distance, that bridge stanchion is tiny. And there's no explanation for it on the globe because with their, with their model. Sorry, someone wants to say something? No, I don't think so. Uh, there's no explanation for it for them because the problem is even on their model this is viewable from that height at that distance we do have even according to their globe belief he has direct line of sight to the, this bridge stanchion uh, at that height that he's at so there is no reason for him to not be uh, in direct line with the very top of that center bridge stanchion other, other than the fact that it's angular size change. And they didn't have any answer for that. 
they didn't know what to say. Well, I I read in the chat afterwards. Well, it don't matter. Like they, they like that. They, that's just it's not only it's only in, it's only silly stuff. The the mountains in the back are still they're still smaller. Let's just say right. This is the the kind of nonsense he, I, I read about. But fight the flat out didn't have much to say. Like he just said, well, he was basically making my argument for me, and he didn't really realize it. You know, because in the fuller scope, if if you see the full photograph, those uh, stanchions are way way smaller because they're much because they're twenty five miles from him. You know, so that's why. So there is now. I'm not saying that Miles Davis had his camera perfectly leveled, but it doesn't matter. The point is that's his center frame. If he wanted to get an exact center frame with something in the distance, he would have had to seemingly tilt it to, to match up with this. That's what he would right. have had to do. It's the same thing. Yes, yeah. we're talking about the same thing. It's over for them. They're numpty dipshits. Yeah. Well, here's, yeah. here's something. Here's something to consider. This also debunks. Um, this would also debunk what uh, Zanuck shows up for the HUD, HUD display, because if you were to take a line, let's say, and draw it across the top of those uh, towers or those bridges, that would look like the horizon. So, if you're moving closer, that would rise up to the crosshairs. But as you move further away, it's going to drop accordingly. So then it would look, even with a HUD display, it would look like it's down in between the, the crosshairs and the horizon, even because of perspective. So even perspective still play. This is this is great, Brian. You've, you've just demolished all kinds of stuff with this. you just smashed a lot. Thanks, Paul. Did, uh, one shot. Sorry. Did you hear? I Well, you didn't check your messages, Nathan. You probably missed it. Did you hear Craig the Numpty fight the fat girth? He he's back on. He doesn't understand. He still doesn't understand angular velocity and tangential speed. I made a little clip of it. I sent it to you. Come to play it. I heard that. <laughs> yeah. Craig fight the fat girth. Numpty dipshit. Eight May, twenty twenty. Even though the whole thing is rotating at the same speed, right? No, the whole thing isn't rotating at the same speed. That is tangential speed however every point on that rotating sphere or platform has the same angular velocity the problem is you don't understand the difference between tangential speed and angular velocity you'd fail junior high intro to physics because you're a numpty dipshit and you just don't learn I toe tagged this same numpty dipshit in this from you two months ago, 24 March 2020. It's that difference in the tangential velocity. Wrong again, numpty. All points on a rotating sphere or platform have the same angular velocity. You're a dipshit. That would mean for an, an observer in the inertial reference frame, it would appear to deviate for them because they are part of the reference frame that it's all moving in. What in the fuck are you talking about? The observer in the inertial reference frame isn't moving. Everything in the non-inertial spinning reference frame is moving because it's spinning. You're a moron. You're just making shit up. So even though from the outside observer it appears it's going in a straight line, for the person that's in the same reference frame as the thing that is moving from one area of tangential velocity to another, it would deviate. Wrong again, bozo. You don't understand the difference between tangential speed and angular velocity. You can't move from one area of angular velocity or tangential velocity on a spinning platform or sphere to another area of tangential velocity or angular velocity. Why? Because they all have the same angular velocity. Your brain dead baller compadres better friggin' tackle your dumb ass and stuff some dirty socks in that incoherent pile of your son because you're really screwing the pooch. With your convoluted, made-up horseshit. What the Coriolis actually is, is a... I mean, and it's actually referred to in, in several physics books as the law of conservation of angular momentum. Yeah, yeah. And Liberace's grandmother was a Mau Mau fighter pilot and a Saudi prince. 
Can you show us these several physics books, dipshit bonehead? You probably got them from the Rocco Club O School for Typewriter Maintenance in Narnia. Number one, law of identity violation. The Coriolis effect and the law of conservation of angular momentum are two different things. They're two different concepts with two different names. So let's take a look at these two different concepts and see if your nonsensical bullshittery holds any water, Gilligan. The Coriolis effect from Seagard Duckless Introduction to Ocean Sciences. When set in motion, freely moving objects including air, that's atmosphere, and water masses, that's clouds and water vapor, move in straight paths while the Earth continues to rotate independently. Because freely moving objects are not carried with the Earth as it rotates, they are subject to an apparent deflection called the Coriolis effect. To an observer rotating with the Earth, freely moving objects that travel in a straight line appear to travel in a curved path on the Earth. So that's the Coriolis effect. Let's take a look at the Law of Conservation of Momentum from the Khan Academy. There are many conserved quantities in physics. They are often remarkably useful for making predictions in what would otherwise be very complicated situations. In mechanics, there are three fundamental quantities which are conserved. These are momentum, energy, and angular momentum. The conservation of momentum is mostly used for describing collisions between objects. Just as with other conservation principles, there's a catch. Conservation of momentum applies only to an isolated system of objects. In this case, an isolated system is one that is not acted on by force external to the system, i.e. there is no external impulse. What this means in the practical example of a collision between two objects is that we need to include both objects and anything else that applies a force to any of the objects for any length of time in the system. End of citation. Gail again. Basketballs and bull weevils have more in common. In conclusion, you're a delusional, double speaking, Dunning Kruger, numpty dipshit of epic proportions. Hmm. Very good. Good snippet. Thank you. But th the point is that he says these things so fast, he makes shit up. From I don't know where he gets it from. This it's not even wiki parroting. It's just making shit up on the fly. And he you says it real tell. fast. And you, you can't Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you could tell he was making that up. His description of the Coriolis, that was the, like, what the hell? <laughs> what did he even say? Well he said that yeah. it was, <laughs> he said it was an observation oh, yeah. from the inertial reference frame. So he doesn't understand what the Coriolis effect is. At all. He actually produced a paper that was supposed to support him. Now, I wasn't looking at the YouTube page. I was looking at the Hangout, and the v he uses a, a software called vMix, the vMix page. And when he put it up on the page, I couldn't read it. It was all kind of blurry, and I just thought it was down to just that itself. Um, and I found out later when I looked at the uh, YouTube uh, video that I could read it on the YouTube video, but I, I didn't want to see, look at YouTube because I was busy doing other things that I wanted to keep concentrated. But it turns out, I thought only he could read it and the audience couldn't because it was like bad text or something like that. But it was just on the vMix page that it looked like that to me. But it, I, I, I went and I tried to type in what he said, where he said it was coming from, and I got no, pay, no, no web page exists. Now, I, and so I asked him, I've sent him a message to say, will you send me the link for that, uh, that thing you, you, you uh, you uh you presented that paper you presented and he asked him that i that i haven't seen it up to now anyway that he asked him that she sent it to me because I, I wanted to get it because it actually disproves what he says it disproves what he's saying but this is what he used as his proof you know and actually went but after time i couldn't read it because it was all kind of blurry and i just thought it was down to the text but that he was that he was trying to use this thing as uh, trying to amalgamate uh it was from some education site in the us Hey, Nathan, well, did, I, go ahead. Go did, did he read the document? Yeah, he read one part of it. He read one part of it, just the first two lines. Actually, I, 
I once I get it actually. I get it. I screenshot it. One second now, if you don't just uh... go ahead, go ahead, tenth. Yeah, uh, chocolate or somebody, maybe Paul, if you can, after Brian's done, post a uh, snippet I have of what Andrew Thomas Young has said. Uh, uh, I want to talk about that after he's done. Yeah, I it's have a it master here. B. Sorry, Ted. No, go ahead, Brian. I have it here. I'll make it a bit bigger if I can. Uh, you should be, it says, seeing my screen. I still have a couple of photos left to show Nathan as well, just before uh, we finish on this. Uh, okay, this is it. This is the only part he read out. But this is not the, apparent thing, the important thing. It's what he said after. An important physical law is that the angular momentum of an object does not change unless acted upon by a torque, force times perpendicular distance. This is known as the law of conservation of, mom of angular momentum. Think of ice skater spinning. For our slow... For our sliding puck, there are no torques acting on it. Therefore, the product V Y R equals constant. Duh! That doesn't say anything. You but not you. Yeah. Fact <laughs> to fact, Earth. What what does this have to do? What does the law of conservation of momentum and or the conservation of angular momentum have to do with the Coriolis effect? This doesn't have anything to. What do you think? The freaking skater is spinning in some type of inertial reference frame or something. It, it, what he said after this was he came out with a load of nonsense about three lines or four lines of nonsense that had nothing to do with what was read. Exactly. Nothing to do yeah. with it. This has nothing to do with it. And you don't know the difference between angular momentum and momentum. Also, fight the fat girth. You dipshit. My no, word, people. No, he, I don't think he does because I, I mentioned the, the roundabout would have angular momentum and the ball being thrown would have would have uh, linear momentum. And they would have momentum going in two different ways. And I said, which wouldn't change the visual effect. That's the only way I said that any that the law of conservation of momentum at all could be applied. And he, he, he kind of, he didn't say anything about that. He just went, well, no, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think he realized the difference between angular and and uh, and linear momentum. <laughs> yeah. So what he does is throw a throw a study up. I know somebody else that did this. I'm not going to mention any names. Just throw a study up, right, and then talk over it, but not read it, or just read a small section of it, right? That this doesn't. What does this have to do with the Coriolis effect? Por favor. Nothing. Please. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. The rest of... Sorry, John. The, the rest right. of the, the thing did have... Uh, let me see. Where did I... Oh, I just to go to... Oh, that's a good picture. Yeah, I put that up earlier when you were speaking about it. Uh, I don't know if I screenshotted the other part. Yeah, I did. Sorry. Here's, this, here's, the, here's the rest of it. It does have, it's talk about that, the Coriolis effect in this. But it talks about what well, it says the the uh, the bunks him anyway. That's the part he read out, just here, and here is the rest. You want me? I'll read out, and there is the Coriolis and the atmosphere underneath. If you want, I'll read it out. I I don't mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, read it. Okay, so starting from underneath where he finished. Therefore, when the radius r increases, the velocity v y must decrease. This means that the puck must deflect to the right as it is left behind, as it now has a smaller tangential speed than a point below it on the rotating platform. Also, a puck pushed towards the center will also veer to the right. In this case, the radius decreases and the velocity of the puck increases. Therefore, it moves faster than the rotating platform and is deflected to the right. To an observer in an inertial frame of re reference, viewing the rotating platform from above, always sees the puck slide in a straight line, pass uh, with constant speed, while while the platform rotates under the moving puck. For the for the observer in the inertial frame of of reference, the acceleration of the puck is zero. There, there, uh, sorry, there, the total horizontal force acting on the puck must also be zero. For the observer in the non-inertial frame of reference, the puck must accelerate because it moves in a curved, uh, sorry, a curved path, and therefore the puck must be acted upon Bullshit. by some hor hor yeah, horizontal force. 
this force is called the Coriolis force. It, <laughs> Yeah, it not it, it not it not a real force. They, they've messed that up. It is only an artifact of an observation made in an on an inertial frame of reference. They just contradicted the, themselves. Yes, hold on, QB. Yes. Yeah. I'm itching to to highlight the same thing. Oh, okay, go on, bro. sorry about that. Go on, bro. Sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, will, will I continue on to, to the end of this? Well, it's your point. Uh, it's just me and QB are itching to highlight, presumably, we now know the reason why you're reading this out, and we just don't want to hijack your point. So, yeah, feel free to continue. Yeah, no worries. Uh, uh, the relatively slow rotation of the Earth uh, makes its effects very small in situations such as throwing stones or walking. However, many of the atmospheric and oceanic characteristics that we take for granted are due to the effects of the Coriolis force. Now, okay, uh, yeah. if you want to say something about there before, I was going to say you, you, you can probably stop there because the, the, that bullshit continues on with the same double speak contradiction bullshit that we had in the first assertion with the perk. So, uh, do you want to identify it, Brian? If not, either I or myself or Quantum Eraser will. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're double speaking because they're saying it's it's a uh, they're, they're basically saying uh, that uh, uh, that we will see it, but we don't see it. No, oh, uh, no, no. What what they're doing is they're they're describing the force the puck experiences, and then in the <laughs> next sentence they describe it as a not actual force. Now, ac <laughs> actual Coriolis is a not actual deviation because the thing you're observing in the inertial reference frame is traveling in a straight path or not moving at all, but it seems to curve. Seems to, not actually. Now, in their first detailed explanation, they're describing how there's an actual force being applied to it to actually curve its path. That's right, yeah. yeah. No, well, that's not write... Coriolis. Because <laughs> it's a not actual curving in Coriolis, and they're detailing an actual force actually curving a puck. <laughs> I could do a whole show on that paragraph right there and rip it to frigging shreds. There, who who wrote this? A magician. A ma hold on. A magician that needs to take a not actual force and turn it into an actual force that does things. But, and that's what they've done in that sentence. There's only one sentence where they do it. They describe how the puck moves with a force being applied. And in the next breath say it's not actual force. And then they move on to describe how that not actual force churns up rivers and oceans and wind currents. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is yeah. an absolute cluster screw of contradiction. Ooh. Hold on a second. Who wrote this? Do you do you have the author? No, I asked him who it was, and he just gave me. He just named out a, a site on, on uh, in the in the debate. He just named out. It was a. I can't remember the name. He named okay. out. Okay. Um, okay. Go to the Coriolis and the app. I can't. The print is so small on here. I can't see it. Let's try and so, get, but I see uh, the Coriolis and the atmosphere. <laughs> please, yeah. please. Okay. Uh, Coriolis and the atmosphere. One second. Now I find it. Uh, it's the big green one. Second paragraph. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Do you want me to read this now? Yeah. Please. Yeah. To discuss wind patterns, consider standing on the top of a spinning globe, North Pole. You attempt to throw a stone due south, parallel to the surface. From above the North Pole, this is qualitatively the same situation as the platform rotating anti-clockwise. Thus, the stone will veer to the thrower's right, west. If you were standing at the south pole, then the earth would be rotating in a clockwise sense. Therefore, <laughs> therefore the stone would veer to the left, west. The consequence of the Coriolis force due to the earth's uh, rotation is that for, for winds, uh, sorry, for winds from any direction. And then it goes on to say winds in the southern hemisphere will always be deflected to the left. Winds in the northern <laughs> hemisphere. This is a ridiculousness. Of it. It's great. It'll be yeah. It's the same thing. Go on, carry yeah. on, Brian, if you want to make a point. Yeah, I, uh, the, the last part is the magnitude of the Coriolis force F depends upon the density of the air or the wind speed V, the angular speed of the Earth's rotation. And there's, a, there's an equation there is the period of the Earth's uh, rotation and another uh, T equals 24 hour and the latitude as described by the equation. So, uh, there's a, more down here, but I, I can't read it. Oh, but that's bit, okay, no. okay. Do, do you want to make a point, or if not, QE, yeah. you go? What, what I was doing, my first thing, what was the most important thing, although I know there's a lot of contradictions and nonsense about the wind, my very first thing was that it's telling you that you will see it. And they keep on telling us that you won't see it. They're telling us that I, you will see it. 
And that was the thing that I that I latched onto with it. But I also saw the wind thing. It was like ridiculous. And I knew when I showed it that I, I, met, I forgot I had, I had screenshotted this part. But I knew the, that would be a laugh. Now, I, I, that's what I have to say about it. Did you have a comment you wanted to add, Kiwi? If not, I will. I'm not adding any to, anything to this fucking rag. If you believe this, then you're dumber than the person who wrote it. Okay, so they've got the description of a not actual deflection in the form of a stone. Stone gets thrown, travels straight, earth turns underneath, seems to deviate from your position at the North Pole in their description. They then go on to describe the storms with their actual spin directions. This is why you end up with idiots like Kosho coming in asserting that the winds are actually travelling in a straight line and only appearing to deviate, because stuff like this explains it in that way. It's got a convoluted contradiction between not actual deviation of a stone with earth turning underneath and the actual spin direction of a hurricane being observed from the North Pole. Well, that'll leave you with the impression that you're looking down on a storm, metaphorically, and it's rotating because you're rotating underneath. In other words, it's not actually rotating at all. It's travelling straight. It only appears to because you're rotating underneath, as per the Coriolis not actual deflection that you'll appear to see. Well... If that's the case, you've got winds travelling straight. Obviously, you haven't got winds travelling straight. Hurricanes have actual spin directions. But you'll end up with some fundamentalist, globe-believing religious zealot coming here saying, yeah, the wind's actually travelling straight. It only appears to go in a circle because I'm rotating underneath it. You're like, uh, no, <laughs> hurricanes actually spin. So how can observation do anything? <laughs> They can't. You watching something from a non-inertial... You had the same point earlier. Very good timing, Paul. Kudos. Exactly. When you're watching something appear to do something from a spinning reference frame, your observation of it isn't going to be doing anything. In other words, the plane in the air, if you're watching it seem to curve, isn't going to go, holy crap, where's my Coriolis um, atten uh, attenuator? Somebody on the ground's watching me seem to curve. I must <laughs> correct for this. <clears throat> my my problem wow. is the little line on the top that has to do with the conservation of momentum. Talking about uh, the object and how it's not changing or changing its force or whatever. But what does that have to do with the observation that the person is making from the non-inertial reference frame? It's what a training manual <laughs> for juxtaposition between the projectile and what it is doing and the forces that are applied to it in reality and how they get around the effect Coriolis would have to have on projectiles with Coriolis itself, which is an observation of something not actually happening. So they've just <laughs> got a training manual to get people to double speak around them being able to describe things that are happening to a bullet or a plane or anything else in the inertial reference frame. When describing those things happening to the projectiles has nothing, literally nothing to do with Coriolis. It's only ever an ob observation from spinning reference frame. Therefore, it doesn't I matter what another, the projectile's doing. I got another question. What are they? They're using a puck, a hockey puck. Really? So, is it? Where is the hot? What reference frame is the hockey puck in? The non-inertial spinning reference frame. It's attached to it. Uh, uh, yeah. What's their point? They don't have one. To have Coriolis effects, the puck would have to be in the inertial reference frame. Therefore, this has absolutely nothing to do with Coriolis. There's just a, a mild, vague, somewhere in the distance comparison that you could make because you've got both things being described on a rotating platform. However, this description is all about one reference frame. It seems a little convoluted. Convoluted, it's f riddled with contradiction. They're describing actual <laughs> forces being applied and then detailing how they're not actual in the next sentence. <laughs> right. Makes sense. A bit convoluted. <laughs> it's like me coming up to you, Arwin, pushing you over and then spending the next two or three breaths explaining how what I did wasn't really a force. I hadn't actually interacted with you. It was only an apparent force that pushed you over. They're describing how the puck's being pushed into a particular path. And then saying, this isn't an actual force. Uh, what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's being moved. The curving of the physical platform that's moving with a low friction base is giving it a push in one direction or another after you've shoved it 
on a non-inertial spinning reference frame? What are you going to compare that to what you'd observe if it left it? It hasn't left it. <laughs> well, it seems to function at least somewhat because I'm completely lost at this point. Yeah, it's it's a way of programming fundies into describing what happens in a frame of reference that has friction. So in this case, you've got a puck that's sliding around with low friction. Well, they want that scenario, what the puck is experiencing in this description, to be a plane with Velcroed atmosphere dragged along with the Earth and dragging the plane with it. That's what they want. One reference frame. Right. But with a vague, loose association to Coriolis because you've got some spinning in the example. No, 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 no. All Coriolis is is something leaving or not being attached to in the first instance, something that's spinning. In the example at the beginning of the show, roundabout with a lamppost cemented into the ground, not spinning with you. As you watch the lamppost from the spinning reference frame, you on it, it seems to come towards you and then go away. Come towards you, go away. It's not moving at all. It's concreted into the ground. But that apparent movement of that lamppost is the apparent movement being described in the inertial reference frame. The lamppost is in the inertial reference frame, even though it's not moving. Likewise, a guy could be sat on the park bench watching from the inertial reference frame, which is what this describes quite frequently, and what Craig described inaccurately. Now, at the time, I just said he didn't understand Coriolis. No, he's got this as his explanation. That's why he detailed an observation from the inertial reference frame. Absolutely nothing to do with Coriolis. But when he's detailing what the projectile's doing and how it's doing it, that's all taking place in what he's going to call the inertial reference frame, when he's actually meaning the spinning frame of reference in Coriolis. Something totally different to what's being described here. So it's, yep. it's basically a training manual. Training manual for how to juxtapose the projectile and what it's doing with what you're observing. That's what it is. It's also telling us that we will see uh, the apparent deviation of a stone we throw if we're at the North Pole or South Pole. But As in, we will see it. We will to those places to see it. Yet, uh, earlier on, they said that you won't see it by throwing a stone. I think up here. They said something. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be this... half step in between each double speak. It's got to, you know, it's got to, it's got to make, mix it up all in a big fat bowl. And at the end of it, there's going to be contradictions between the examples that give you not actual deflection and the actual deflection that they've got versus the not actual deflection of a stone that is actual deflection because it's curving versus the not actual deflection of Coriolis with the actual rotation of hurricanes. I mean, like Quantum Eraser says, you could spend an entire show on this one paragraph. <laughs> hey Nathan, I've got that quote in Master B by Andrew Thomas Young. Can someone post it? And I'll read Certainly. it. Certainly. Uh, just before we do, though, did you want to add anything more, Brian, or Quantum Eraser on this? And then, if not, we'll move on to Tenth. Are, are, are we getting away from the Coriolis Force? This is nothing to do with uh, Coriolis. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. One small thing right below, like I said, the print so small, right below the centered winds in the Southern Hemisphere nonsense, it says the magnitude of the Coriolis force depends on, does it say density? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Depends on the density of the air? Yes. The magnitude of an apparent deflection. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's the magnitude that they've got in the plane. I think they mean the same Coriolis oh, force. Let me work out. So in the plane, right, he's got an, uh, an attenuator to cope with the magnitude of apparent drift that the guy on the ground's observing. <laughs> he's got to, he's got to focus that little attenuator in on how much the magnitude. How much is the guy on the drift uh, on the ground seeing we're drifting? We need to cope with that because it's got a magnitude. <laughs> yeah, he's so that, oh boy. But, but this is basically the, this is just, just one last conclusion, not actual forces or apparent effects. Do not have magnitudes. <laughs> right but nathan this is ba it basically comes down to this is a giant new construction to replace the coriolis effect which has nothing to do with with yeah real yeah displacement and all that it's an effect and this is their fictional replacement for the word that it that is attributed to the virtual spinning of their presupposed ball earth Hey, I need this document. Reality. 
Thanks. Yeah, I, I, did I get that right? Oh, then, yes, Owen, good summary, but I want to move on to 10th man now. I know, Brian, you've got one more point. You can have the last word. I just I have a couple of more photographs to uh, to uh, to add on to the rest. There's three more to the end okay. of what I was showing. But I leave ten, what I do is I launch I launch I stop my screen sharing. I leave tenth, uh, make his point, and I'll come no, back no, no. to those. Carry on. No, no, no. Carry on. I've, I've sure. moved tenth off screen. You carry on. Get to the end of your presentation. Okay. Uh, I got it. Hope before he goes. Yeah. I need that document. I need yeah. you to take at least a couple sentences out of there so I can go search for it. Can, can, is it possible to do that? I can just send you the screenshot if you want. You can have the whole lot. Yeah, then I have to do all the damn work. <laughs> you, you, you send me a message of what you want me to do when I do it. All right. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> the perfect words for Quantum Eraser. Don't ever say things <laughs> like that to him. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, okay. You're still unpresented. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> so the last one I showed was the Miles Davis photograph. Now, but I'm only adding these the next two photographs in uh, because of what the boilers tried to do with the fact that I was showing what they tried to do with the fact that I was showing that uh, his center frame or not, like just a, where he was looking appeared to be higher than the exact same height at, at a distance. Uh, they said, well, that doesn't matter because the hills in the back are still are still lower than they should be. This nonsense. So <clears throat> this here, at the background there, I have my camera up above uh, up above the uh, top of this uh, this this little uh, bottle here. And in the background here to the left, you have a, another bottle just down at the other. It's only a two foot away, not even two foot uh, away from this bottle. And as you can see a little bit of the cap of it. Uh, now. I didn't have a longer table to use at that particular time. So I was just going to bring on the next one and there you go. You have to see the actual size of it. So that disproves their argument with the mountains straight away. Because if I had a longer, if I had even a four foot table, then the top of this one in this shot wouldn't have been, would have been down here. You know, it, it would have been down in level with it. If I could just stretch out another foot due to angle or size change. But that's the actual size of it as opposed to up here. You really see that little portion of it up here, just just because it was at a distance. And I have my camera up above the, you can see up above the top of this uh, this white one here. Now the last one, the last picture I'm going to show, I meant to have it there a second ago. I'll have to just get it there. I know where it is. Uh, into into here, and I'll have to just do this. Find it. It's in these ones. These are photographs I got of of that bridge that Miles Davis find the one I'm looking for. There's a lot of good ones here. This is a good one, for instance. Because <clears throat> this is closer to that bridge, and you can see the, the hills here are way higher than it. And now it's up high. We're looking at it up high. But that would but it doesn't matter. The hills are not down below it. The, it's like the hills are way higher than it over here. And there is the highest stanchion of that bridge. And these are photographs that were just not taken by people who are looking to prove anything. Um, and this one, this is the one. There is, I know, I know it's from a high position, but there is, there is the bridge stanchion, and it's clear that the, the hills here are a lot bigger than it. And the Dow's hills in the background here are way bigger. And the hills behind the, the bridge stanchion are 25 miles behind the bridge stanchion. So it's 25 miles from where Moyes Davis is to the bridge, and another 25 miles are there about. To the to the hills, something or, something like that. It's very it's twenty four miles maybe twenty five, but it's a, it's a long distance. Uh, and this one, this is the one, right? There is the bridge, and there is the hills behind it, and th these hills would be miles and miles and miles behind it. And some of the ones are in Miles Davis's photo. I don't know if you could see uh, from this angle, but these are the closer ones, and they're way higher than the bridge. So. You know, their argument is that the hills are going down behind because of the gravity or nonsense, but it's not. This just shows if you're taking the photograph from a different place that you get a different you get a different view. And that's it. Oh, thank you Anyone very much. Anything else before I stop? Thank you very much for that, Brian. Blinded. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on to 10th man, I've got you back up presented. All right. Uh, everyone see calculating atmospheric refraction? 
the audience can. Okay, good. Uh, the title itself, Calculating Atmospheric Refraction. First thing out of his mouth. All the discussion above deals with plane surfaces, period. But the Earth isn't flat, exclamation point. This is the disease of the ballers. They have presupposition of a spinning ball. They beg the question. This is why they explode anytime they have to prove it, because it doesn't match the plane surfaces, as Andrew Thomas Young is saying here. So you got to do geometric considerations to change it. If you're on Earth and you're doing a study on refraction, and you say all the calculations you have is from a plain surface, then how can you have a title calculating atmospheric refraction? They're blind on purpose. Because you're not supposed to pay attention to that, Tenth Man. Come on, you're spoiling the gag. That's how it works. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who tuned in on the Nathan Oakley Premier Ring stream for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Of course, a massive thank you to today's Discord and G Plus panels for making this after show possible. Be sure to check out NathanOakley.com and the Flat Earth Debate Forum to keep up to date with the community debate. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video. <laughs>